Um, so, good morning, California. Um, my name is Phil Dector, as Susan mentioned. This is uh, Sonia Parker. Um, good morning. This is the first time we've trained together. We've been friends for a number of years. We're very excited that Susan's given us an excuse to get together and actually do some work together. And so we've got, a, I think, a really good couple of days for you. Um, before we get started, I uh, really appreciate the acknowledgement of Jennifer and Matt. And I think in particular, if you notice, Matt's got some bags under his eyes. I think he's been making photocopies 24-7. Um, so do be kind to Matt and give him a thanks. But I also just wanted to acknowledge Susan Brooks for just a second. Um, Susan's skills as a networker and a builder of communities to me are second to none. And uh, I'm grateful for everything she's done to move this practice forward. So, thank you. So we're going to take a couple minutes just to kind of locate ourselves and our context a little bit. And we're going to talk a little bit about Australia first. Thank you. So yeah, hi California. That's such a nice way to start. This is my first time in Sacramento or Davis. Um, I came to California last year in January. It was my first ever time in the States. And I got to, I flew into San Francisco and a dear friend of mine lives up in Plumas County. So I got to go up to Plumas. Can I check who's here from Plumas? From Quincy, yeah. Is there someone here from Plumas County? Oh, I thought there was. Shame. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's so lovely to be here and it's my first opportunity to wor work in California. And I just want to say an enormous thank you, Susan, to you for the opportunity to come here and have the chance to work with people. I've been hearing Phil talk about his work here with you folk for about the last 12 months and to have the chance to be here. And also, as Phil said, for us to have the chance to work together. I met Phil in 2008 at a Signs of Safety gathering in Gateshead in England, Northern England. And um, I'd heard a lot about Phil and John from Massachusetts. And Phil got to give me a piggyback across the dance floor. You know, you know a piggyback? You guys say piggyback in America? Yeah? Yeah. So Phil got to give me a piggyback across the dance floor. And I think we were kind of, it was one of those connections. You know, sometimes I think you're fortunate enough to meet people and feel like there's a soul connection there to start with. And that was certainly my experience with Phil. So we do lots of collaboration over Skype. Um, sharing ideas about, oh, I tried this, what do you think? You know, or I'm thinking about this, I'm not sure how it's going to work. So we do lots of collaboration. So to have the chance to work together with you feels like a real privilege and a blessing. So I hope we're going to have a great two days together. Um, and I wanted to, yeah, just give you a quick sense of where I'm from. So Australia, can I check who's had a chance to visit Australia? Okay. And across to the west coast, if you don't mind moving yeah. it on. So Sydney and Melbourne over in the east. If you just keep, yeah, thanks. And Canberra, which is our capital city, which hardly anyone ever goes to, but I love it. And I'm from Perth over on the west coast. You can see it's kind of a long way from anywhere. And <laughs> Andrew Turnell and Steve Edwards tell the story that they, one of the reasons they think the signs of safety was able to develop and be a bit innovative is no one knew or cared what was happening in <laughs> Perth, Australia. And so they just went on and worked with you know, all of these practitioners trying out these ideas of how to bring solution-focused questioning and inquiry into the child protection arena and no one paid any attention. And by then it was too late, you know, they'd done it, they were taking it out into the world. So I'm from Perth. I wanted to bring you a couple of shots of Perth just to kind of show you. So this is my city. We've got a beautiful river through the middle of the city, which is a sacred river for our Indigenous people, our Aboriginal people. And there's a lot of sort of song lines and dreaming lines that run through the city. It's a, very, it's a beautiful place. And our beaches, we're kind of known, so here's a beautiful beach. I always make this offer, no one, it, well, people rarely take me up on it, but it's a genuine offer. If you ever you come to Perth, please get in touch. We've got this island that's like 30 minutes by ferry with these kind of beaches and snorkeling and it's always a privilege and a pleasure to take people. So if you come to Perth, please phone me or email me and I'll take you to Rottnest Island. <laughs> Phil Dector, that includes you. Yeah, I'm expecting okay. it. Um, this is my son and my dog. I just wanted to kind of bring a little bit. 
My son's 14. He loves it when I go away and he gets to do pretty much what he likes back home. And this is our dog. We've had her for about a year. She was a rescue dog. I'd never had a dog before. And it's such yeah, it's a wonderful thing to have her in our family. So I wanted to, to bring that. Yeah. So yeah, thank you again, Susan. Thank you so much. I'd heard so much about you through Phil. And um, to having a chance, Susan and I met very briefly at the Signs of Safety gathering in Minnesota last year, in March last year. Um, and to, to hear about all of the ways that California and, and, and the northern counties and your academy are looking to bring signs of safety into your practice and to be integrating SDM and signs of safety, to hear how far you've come in 12 months says to me an enormous amount about your vision, Susan. So thank you for the opportunity. So as uh, many of you know, uh, I'm from a far off land called New England. <laughs> strange, strange place. Uh, it's where our football team is 2-0 and, oh, and our baseball team is right now, but, um, but we're having a good time. Um, it, just real quickly, background for me, I worked for many, many years in child welfare in Massachusetts, uh, foster care agencies, um, uh, crisis intervention work, and then the last ooh, eight, ten years, Massachusetts has been on a journey with these ideas, trying to begin to think about what ways we can bring safety organized practice, what ways we can bring the ideas of signs of safety um, into our work. Massachusetts is a state-run system, so it's not county-based, it's one child welfare organization. So while we're much smaller than California, the agency feels much bigger. Um, so it's a 3,000 person organization. And so as you can imagine, trying to do practice change in a 3,000 person organization is a bit of a challenge. And we've had some good successes and we've had some tough challenges. And um, over the course of these days, I'm sure you'll hear some about that. So. And because Sonia introduced you to her son, I thought I would just briefly introduce you to mine. That's, that's Emmett. Uh, he's 11 years old. You can see he loves to have his picture taken. Um, we spent a good deal of time up in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. They're not nearly as nice as the Sierras, but they're decent. And we like to hike and we like to go up there. So we, we were up there a lot this summer. And you can see he's got his Tom Brady shirt on wearing his colors. So, yeah. Um, we wanted to get a sense of who's in the room. By the way, can I just check in? We don't have two of those lavalier mics. I do have a handheld, but it wasn't working in the beginning. Can everybody hear me in the back? Yeah, OK. I've got one of those booming voices. I'm good with that. OK. Is this all right, or do people want me to use the mic? Can I go like this for a little bit and we see how we go? Is that all right? OK. That's a little easier for me. Yeah, easy. Um, so we thought we'd all go around and everybody could introduce themselves and tell us about your kids too. No, we're not going to do that, really, because you'll kill us. Damn, um, damn. We'd love to do that, though, and at yeah. the breaks, please come and tell us about your children. But yeah. we're going to do it this way. So we're going to locate you in some different ways. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if this applies to you, OK? So if you are from Yolo County, please raise your hand. OK, welcome, Yolo. Shasta County. Shasta County is in the room. Yeah. <laughs> Modoc. Great. Great. Hey, Mama. Uh, El Dorado. All these names I've heard about in movies. It's amazing. <laughs> Del Norte. Okay. Welcome. Woo! It's you, the proud. Woo, woo, woo. Mendocino. Wow. Welcome, Mendocino. Butte County. Hey. Yeah, hey. Thank you. Uh, Lake County. Hey, uh, Inyo. OK, nobody here from Inyo yet? All right, well, they'll come. Nevada, Nevada County, welcome. Hi. Not Nevada country, state? No, not no. Nevada no. state, no. Yeah. Okay. not yet. So, uh, Yuba County, OK, welcome. Hi. Um, OK, Sacramento County. Is there somebody here from Sacramento? I know we're going, Sonia's going down there, but OK, nobody no. from okay. Sacramento yet. OK, um, we also understand that there are some guests from counties that are outside the northern region, and we want to welcome you too. Uh, folks from Alameda County here today? Not quite yet. Not yet. Uh, San Luis Obispo? Hi. Hi, welcome. Uh, Madera? Okay, welcome Madera, we're happy to have you, and I understand you're here for the week, so we'll do our best to make it a good show for you. Uh, San Francisco County, welcome. Glad you're here. Yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, Santa Barbara? Hello, hi. Napa? 
Stanislaus? Okay, welcome. Uh, UC Davis folks. All right. Woohoo! Have I forgotten anybody that we didn't mention? Yes. Sutter. Sutter, my bad. I'm very sorry. Welcome, Sutter. Sutter? <laughs> Just the Sutter? Okay. Excellent. Welcome, Caswick. Thank you. Excellent. Good to have you here. Terrific. And the California Department of Social Services. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. And which county is it? Tehama. Tehama. Welcome. Okay. Um, let's do a second round like that just real quick. If you would primarily identify yourself as a worker, raise your hand. Okay. If you would primarily identify yourself as a supervisor, can you raise your hand? Okay. If you would primarily identify yourself as a manager, can you raise your hand? Okay. And if you would identify yourself as an administrator, policy, management, something like that, but as an administrator, can you raise your hand? Okay, okay great. All right. Um, one last go around again, just to kind of get context in the room. Um, if you have come to a uh, Northern California Training Academy training on signs of safety that I did, or my colleagues from Massachusetts, John Vogel or Sophia Chin, can you raise your hand? Okay, okay, thanks. If you came when Andrew was here in April, can you raise your hand? Okay. If you have never been to a signs of safety training before, can you raise your hand? Okay. Okay. okay, that's helpful. Okay. Yeah. So um, let me say this. We have built this training on the idea that these would be the, these numbers, I think. Yeah. Um, for the folks who've been through trainings, what we're going to try to do is to go deeper into some of the practices. For folks who have not been to training before, we're going to give kind of quick introductions to some of these practices to make sure that you're with us and that you can follow. But for those of you who are here all week, you'll get more of this Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So um, if you're new to this and you're sticking around for the week, what I just say is that if there are places that feel um, uncomfortable or a little confusing, like I'd ask you to hold some of that discomfort and just know that we're going to be talking about this even more in depth as the week goes along. And also to know that you can come up during the break and grab one of us. I think both Phil and I are people who love to talk about practice with people and hear from you. So if, if you are new to this and some of the ideas we're putting forward you don't feel like you've got enough context for, come and grab us during the break. Have a cup of tea. Have a chance to talk some of that through. I wonder, I forgot to say anything about my practice. I wondered if yeah. I could say that sure. quickly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Sorry, I forgot to say a little bit about kind of where I come from in my practice. So I used to be a teacher back in the day and it um, feels like another lifetime ago really. And then I spent probably 10 years doing lots of work as a community organiser, community activist in social justice work, in overseas aid, um, in community empowerment models in Australia with our Indigenous folk um, and working in sort of the peace environment movement and through that somehow very strangely I got to statutory child protection work. I still think back and try and understand the connections. I think it was you know the good spirit sort of taking me on a bit of a journey to be honest. So I've been working using the signs of safety approach in child protection work for about eight years now using this approach and for the last probably three years I've been working as a consultant um, traveling around the world. I've got this amazing job. I get to travel around the world working with jurisdictions all around the world. So I work in Europe and the UK and Japan and the States and New Zealand and Australia. It's amazing. Um, having the chance to stand alongside workers and organizations as people try to make sense of how the signs of safety ideas help to refine and shape their own practice and deepen their own practice. To look at how do these ideas fit into your way of working, into your cultural context. And I work back home, I work with families still. I think it's really important that I continue to try and use these ideas and to try and use them well. So I work with families and I work as consultants to, um, to organisations. So, some of the work you're going to see is, is my own work with families and I feel like I'm on a learning journey. 
You know, I feel like I'm constantly learning and when I work with other counties, there's always, for me, new learning that comes about how do these ideas fit, what else could I be doing in my own practice, so yeah. I guess I just wanted to say I'm very much here as a practitioner and on a learning journey with you guys too. You want to talk a little bit about the background of these ideas? Yeah, so this slide I kind of always like to bring forward. You can move those forward. So the signs of safety approach grew up, as I was saying before, Perth, Western Australia, long way from anywhere. Um, the ideas of Andrew Tunnell and Steve Edwards. Now, Steve Edwards is a long-term had been a long-term child protection worker. He's no longer in child protection. He's working within a, um, an Indigenous land council in Australia, in Western Australia, supporting Indigenous communities to get access to land. So he's taken some of his passion into that area. So Steve was working as a child protection worker for 19 years, um, particularly up in the northern part of Western Australia, and moved down to Perth and was working in a very busy city child protection office, had a lot of young people on his caseload who, who kind of, you know, their lives were a bit off track. They were running amok, lots of juvenile justice issues, um, truanting from school, drug and alcohol use. He referred a number of young people on his caseload to a non-government organisation family therapy program where Andrew Tunnell was working Andrew had a history and experience in family therapy and solution-focused ideas. And he was, he'd, he'd brought Stephen Insu over to Perth. They were using a lot of family therapy ideas in their practice. So he started working with these young people using family therapy and solution-focused ideas. Steve started noticing these young people were making changes in their life, rang saying, what are you doing over there? Because something's working. And Andrew, being a solution-focused therapist, said, well, come and have a look come and stand behind the mirror, have a look. And that began a partnership then between Steve and Andrew of trying to look at how do the solution-focused ideas fit into a child protection context, which is how the signs of safety grew up. So I really want to start off by acknowledging both Andrew and Steve and their work and the enormous amount that I've learned from them and particularly from Andrew. Nikki Weld and Maggie Greening. Can I just check in, who in the room's heard the name Nikki Weld? Maggie Greening? Okay, so who in, the, who in the room has heard of the Three Houses tool? Okay, these are the two people who developed the Three Houses tool. So Nikki Weld, Maggie Greening, women from New Zealand, Aotearoa New Zealand, who um, both were social workers, again working in the child protection context, both as frontline practitioners working in an investigative capacity, putting forward applications to the court to bring young people into care. And Nikki tells a story, she was in court one day and the magistrate ripped shreds off her and said, is that an expression you guys use, rip shreds? It's probably American, I probably learned it from you guys. And basically the magistrate said, what, what is this? This application could be, you know, I've seen 25 of exact same application in the last two months. Who is this young person I've got? There's nothing in your court documents that tell me anything about who this young person is. Where's their voice? And Nikki, being the incredible woman she is, said, you're absolutely right, and went away and did some really hard soul searching and thinking about how she could bring the child's voice and the young person's voice right into the middle. I mean, this is about them. Right into the middle of this work that we do. And she came up with a three houses tool. She was working closely with Maggie Greening, so she really bounced it off Maggie to develop the ideas. Um, I've got Nikki on videotape talking about how she developed the three houses, and I left it at home. So really sorry, we wanted to bring Nikki Weld into the room, but I didn't remember to bring it. <laughs> and so I just really want to honour Nikki particularly, and Maggie as well, in the work they did. And this tool is making such a difference. It's such a simple tool, making such a difference all around the world, both in terms of the way we're engaging young people, but also in reminding us of what everyone knows, which is how easy it is in our work when we get really busy to forget to actually spend so much time talking with a young person and bringing them right into the middle of our work. So I just want to honour these women for that. And Susie Essex, can I check in? Who's heard of Susie Essex? Okay, Susie Essex is the queen of safety planning. 
She's from Bristol, the United Kingdom. She's an amazing woman. She has spent, um, I think, probably 40 years of her life working as a social worker with families in the most difficult of circumstances in the UK. Susie and two of her colleagues developed the resolutions approach for working with denied child abuse. People might have seen the book that Andrew and Susie wrote together, the resolutions approach, and the words and pictures tool. So it was Susie who developed with her colleagues develop those. And Susie has just, I mean, I have learned so much from Susie around safety planning and how to work with families and their networks to have families' ideas right at the middle of meaningful plans to keep kids safe. So yeah, we, we wanted to start by acknowledging these people and also just the kind of countless children, families, workers around the world who certainly I keep learning from and with and these ideas grow from. The Science of Safety approach as it is now is very different from how it was back in the early 90s when it was developed in Perth. It's an approach that is about capturing the best practice ideas from around the world and continuing to bring those into the model. That's how it evolves. So this is, this is a, you know, an ongoing learning journey of, of practice and it's, it's moved far beyond what it was as it started. So it evolves with input from everyone around the world in terms of practice. Okay, here's where we're going. Do you want me to take over that? I don't have to keep sure. telling you when to push the button. Thank you, Mr. Dector. That's Beautiful right. job. Thank you. Thank you. That's what I'm, I'm, here, that, I'm, here, so, yeah. I'm here all week. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we just want to give you a quick sense of what we're going to cover in these two days. So it, Phil's going to take us through some agreements in terms of the two days. I'm not as good at you as this. Right, Bill, hand, right, right hand. Right, right hand click. Yeah. Got right. it. So we're going to look at, we're not going to, to look at the signs of safety framework in a huge amount of detail and how you as a professional use that to kind of map the case. That's going to be covered more Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We're looking at how do you then take this approach to families? How do you sit down with a family when you knock on the door or you're called into the hospital or you are, you know, meeting with a family member in an office or you know, at a police station, wherever that's happening. How are you actually bringing this approach to the family and eliciting the family's views about what's going on in their lives? Then about taking it to the kids. How we, what tools are we using to really get the child's view and help the, child, the kids understand what it is that we're doing, what it is that these processes involve? Looking at then moving towards safety planning and building safety and those long-term safety plans about safety enough in families for us to close the case and walk away. Looking at laying the groundwork for that, doing some revision for some people and, and perhaps some new information for others, looking at danger statements, moving into safety goals and then on the second day we're going to start to move into an overview of how we talk about safety planning within the Science of Safety approach. Looking at goals, looking at eliciting families' goals, that's what's key, that's what's central. Creating a space where we can listen well enough and families are willing to talk to us about what do they think needs to change for safety to be in place for their kids. Same conversation with kids. How do we create a context to be able to have those conversations with kids in ways that are meaningful. And then looking at a safety planning tool, which is just a new tool, um, to use that tool to work with families and their networks to really kind of nail those detailed safety plans, long-term safety plans. So this is usually the part of the uh, flight where the stewardess double checks, the steward or the cabin steward or stewardess checks in and said, so you know, this is the plane that's going to Boise and I hope that you're going to Boise and if you're not, please let us know. <laughs> so um, this is where we're going. I hope this is where you were hoping to go. Uh, do let us know if you were hoping to go somewhere else, but we're not going to promise to go. But I think this will be a good journey. Um, I want to take uh, just a couple last minutes to talk about how we want to work together as a group. So we are a large group. And yet, Sonia and I both feel very committed to as much as possible making this a, um, a learning community for the two days that we are together. Um, my strong belief is that people learn from dialogue. 
people learn from conversation much more than you learn from a two-dimensional slide. So that while we got plenty of slides, what we think is going to make the most learning is when we talk with each other and when you talk with each other. So I just want to kind of uh, set up some uh, thoughts about how we want to do that as a group. So I'd like you, I'm going to take you through a very quick visualization. It's not, not going to take you anywhere too hard. You can look at the floor, you can look at me, you can close your eyes, whatever you'd like. I want you to start by thinking about a training you've been to that you felt really good about. A training where, you know, when you left at the end of that training, you thought, I am really glad I took that time. It may have backlogged my work the rest of the week, but you know, I feel really good. I'm glad I was there. Okay? Just take 15 seconds and just pick a specific time, a training you went to, you felt really good and glad you were there. Second image, I'd like you to think about a different training where maybe you left not feeling quite so happy <laughs> that you had spent the time there. Perhaps you kind of spent the whole time checking your email or thinking <laughs> about uh, what was waiting for you back at your desk, but at the end of the training you thought to yourself, wow, that's 24 hours I'm never getting back in my life, right? <laughs> okay. So take 15 seconds and just think about that training for a second. What we're curious about is can we spend just a couple minutes talking what makes the difference if you think about your two stories? What was different in how the presenters were? What was different in how the group was with each other? What was different in terms of you or what you did or what you didn't do? What, what makes the difference between a training like, so, so if you were to walk out of here tomorrow at 8.30 p.m. when we finish, right? 9.30. <laughs> 9.30, sorry. When you walk out of here tomorrow at whatever time we finish, um, what needs to happen so that you've got a shot at leaving here saying, I'm really glad I took those two days? Can I get some ideas? What would you guys have to do? What would we have to do? What would we all have to do? Yeah. The interaction between the instructors and the audience, not where it's not a lecture with the slides. OK, so that there's some kind of interaction between you guys, participants, and us. And so we're in some of that conversation. Yep. And ask people to speak loudly also. Yeah. I know the thing that I um, appreciate the most about trainings is when I can actually translate it into my everyday practice. Mm -hmm. When you teach me how to do that, it's just why it's pretty good. Okay, so we really can ground it in everyday real practice. And so we get out of kind of the theory and we get out of the perfect and we, we land in the mess of the real work. Yeah. Um, that that would be uh, a, a good thing to do. Yeah. What else? What else makes the difference? Yes. Sorry. I like um, uh, magnitude of uh, participation. <laughs> yeah, a lot of participation and just not one person, you know, um, leading in conversations at all time. I think um, a partnership works better than than not. Okay. So, and were you thinking partnership among mm -hmm. presenters or also like with the? With what? everyone. You know, yeah, everyone. Okay. So that. So that, you know, I, I certainly am in trainings uh, where, believe it or not, those of you that know me may not quite believe this, where I get a little shy. <laughs> and, you know, I, you know, just like, I don't want to put my hands around my hands. And, you know, one of the things I think about, this gets enriched with your dialogue. You know, we, we I think, can make a promise to kind of make sure that we're going to get to our material. We will get to our material. But one of the ways the learning happens, one of the ways we land this in what I call the mess of everyday practice, is if we all are thinking it through together and, and making some space for some of that conversation. Yeah. Okay. What else? What else makes the difference so that you can walk out of here and say you were glad you were here? Yeah. yeah. Actually using the tool here so that I know how to use it when I get back. Absolutely. So getting some practice here. 
Um, and certainly all the research and new research in brain theory will tell you that doing something has got your 100% best shot of being able to retain it. Not just talking about it, not thinking about it, but actually doing it. It's going to give you your best chance. And so we, I think we've tried to create a couple of days to do that, but I appreciate you saying that. Yeah. Yeah, Mike. Knowing, it is, knowing what it is that I really want and knowing how to recognize that I really got it at the end. Okay. So that's a really nice one, too. You know, it might be worth, like, taking a second just to yourself to really think, what's your goal? for these two days and being really clear to yourself, what am I hoping to walk away with? And then, you know, at the right moments, either making sure that we're kind of speaking into that, whether that's in the big group or outside of the big group, but being really clear, what is it I'm hoping to get out of these two days? And then being able to recognize, hopefully, I, I got it. Yeah. Okay. One other way I, I like to try to help a group, and by the way, folks, um, we think a lot about what helps adults learn. You know, there's so much about kids and kids learning. But when you bring a group of adults together and you want to, you're taking people away from very busy jobs, you want to think about well, what, what helps adults learn. One of the things that I think about are agreements. And I don't like the word ground rules. I think the word ground rules feels a little patronizing to me. I don't think we need ground rules. Agreements to me are about aspirations. They're about what are we saying we're, try we're agreeing to to work together. And what I love about this is just so you know, I don't sit with a family without making agreements. Because it's my sense is that if the family doesn't understand why we're here, and if the family doesn't have some sense of how are we going to work together, then they can't participate. right? And so whatever group I'm working with in a training context with a family, I am a big fan of making agreements. Here are some agreements that we are proposing to guide us for the next two days, just really quick. That we would respect all requests for confidentiality and anonymity. What I mean by this is this is a large group. We're going to put you in small group activities a number of times. If somebody tells you a story but asks that you keep it in yourself, could we keep it to yourself? Could we have a little what is said in Davis stays in Davis moment, right? Okay. <laughs> So that if someone asks for privacy, that we could give them. That while we have a lot of activities, I think it's a really bad idea to force anybody to do something they don't want to do in a training context. Generally, that doesn't work out too well for me as the trainer. <laughs> right? So that while we want to encourage you to participate in all of the activities, that everybody always has the right to pass. Okay? You can say, like, I don't want to do this, and you don't need to explain why. That silence can be a contribution, right? That, uh, uh, but I, what I mean by this, though, is a silence that is a presence. That you're here, that you are taking this in in your own way. It doesn't mean you need to talk all the time. doesn't mean you don't need to. Um, one, this is what I not, don't mean by silence, though. I once gave a training a while ago in a room about this size. And about midway through the second day, way, way, way in the back, about where Susan is, there was a lovely gentleman gently <laughs> snoring away. That's not the kind of contribution I'm talking about. Okay? Um, that we agree to share airtime and stick to time limits. And so Sonia and I have this mapped out. We have a 75-page outline. No, just kidding. It's only two. But um, you know, we have some time limits. And so we will let you know. And we've built in space for the conversation parts of this, but that we'd all kind of agree to do that. Um, that we speak personally for ourselves as individuals. What I mean by this is that um, we be careful about things like, of course, all social workers should know. Of course, everybody from MODOC does. You know, like, so you know, that we speak for ourselves, right? We speak out of our experience. Um, that we could agree to disagree. You know, that, that while we have a lot of love for these practices, we understand that it's a journey and that we're interested in kind of where you go with this. Um, and so, you know, that we could make an agreement that we may not agree on all of this, but that's actually part of how we learn, too, is through some of that disagreement. Um, some basic communication stuff. We agree to allow other people to finish speaking and not interrupting. And a personal one that will just slay me, that we avoid the side conversations. And I totally get this. Look. Um, you're out of the office. You're getting to, to see people maybe you haven't seen before. Like, you want to catch up? You want to talk about your kids? I want to tell you about my kid. Um, here's the thing. Just take it outside. Like, I'm really good with it. 
but like, let's try to make this a space where we can all work together. Um, and that we'd all work together, all of us, to hold to these agreements. We make a commitment that we're all going to work on these together. How does this sound to you? Is there anything up here that you'd like to tweak or offer an amendment to? Or does this feel like good agreements for us to kind of go through the next two days? Yes? I would like to add that um, there's no stupid questions. If you're thinking about it, somebody else is probably too. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Nicely said. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a really important one. And often one I find is that when someone says it, they're actually speaking for a number of people in the room. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Others? OK. Last bit of housekeeping. I just want you to know what's in front of you so that, because um, uh, we're going to reference it a couple of times. Um, so there is a yellow PowerPoint yeah. that's in front of you. And because Ms. Parker and I share an equal obsession with PowerPoint. At 10 p.m. last night at the Hampton Inn, we were still tweaking the slides just a little bit. Susan, just a little bit, I promise, OK? <laughs> um, so you may find that this doesn't 100% match what's in front of you, but it's 98% there. If there's any particular slide you want, we will get it to you. We did not really go far afield. Can I speak yeah. to that? You'll also notice, notice you've got a set of handouts in there. So I'm going to ask you now not to read ahead. <laughs> Not to read ahead, only because I've given you the answers in there to one of the exercises that Phil and I have talked through and agreed we're going to do, and I don't want you to read them. <laughs> so in, in, seriously though, in terms of saying don't read ahead, the last couple of pages, 49 and 50, if you can just not look to that, because we want you, we want, as, <laughs> now, and of course, of course, what I know about learning is that if I say to someone, don't do it, <laughs> everyone's going to do it. Let me just give a little bit of context. So part of what we're going to ask you to do is actually do some work later in generating safety goals. And I've given you my, th my safety goals that I developed for this particular family. So if you can hold off reading those until you've had the chance to think that through, reflect that, do that work yourself, that's where the learning will be, not in reading mine. Thank you. Okay. Hold up their hand who's going to go ahead and read them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> OK. All right. So we're excited to be here. We've set some context. We've made some agreements. And I think we're going to have a great couple of days. We are going to begin with you guys and your wisdom and us really grounding ourselves in the children that make this work really important. So I'm going to ask you to do something that may be the most, the hardest thing that you will have to do in the next two days. Somehow in this room, the way the space is set up, can you twist and turn your body and find someone you don't know for this next activity, OK? And feel so, free to move. Yeah, so feel, feel free. free to move, but locate someone, and then we'll take you through the activity. To introduce yourself? Okay, here we go. Um, just to yourself to start with, I'd like you to think about a child you have worked with, either as a worker or a supervisee, as a manager, but one where it feels present for you, the details feel present for you where you feel like you really made a difference, where you feel like you really made a contribution to keeping that child safe, to moving them to where they needed to go, to helping them take a step in their journey. I want you to think about a specific time, a specific child, where you felt like you really made a difference. I'm going to give you 30 seconds just to think about that yourself. Don't want you to start talking yet, OK? So take 30 seconds and just think about this time where you felt like you really made a difference in a child's life.
just to yourself again, just in your own head and heart, what's one thing you did with that child that you feel particularly proud of? It's okay. one thing you've done you feel particularly proud of. And when you're clear about that, I'd like you just to write that child's name down on a piece of paper in your kit somewhere. It could be on the folder, but somewhere you're going to be able to access it because we're going to come back to this later, okay? So just write that child's name down. Okay, staying where you are, I want you to bring to mind then a time where you've worked with a family, with a child or a young person, and it didn't go anywhere nearly as well as you would have liked. <coughs> where you feel like you weren't able to get alongside that child as much as you might have liked, where you weren't able to make as much of a difference in that child's life as you might have hoped, and where you feel like you weren't able to give that child an opportunity to, for their voice to be heard. So bring that to mind. And just spend a little bit of time, just, just for a moment, thinking about what's your best sense at this point of what got in the way of that? What got in the way of you being able to bring your best practice to that child? And again, we're inviting that child to be with us here in the room. Yeah? So invite, just write down that child's name as well. So as we're going forward, we're journeying forward with those young people, with those children here with us. I'd like you to, to have a quick conversation with this person you've just met, okay? Um, you can share some headlines about these two stories if you want. You don't need to tell the full stories. You won't have time to do that. But we'd like you to do some thinking. And we've put up some starter dough questions for you. Um, what do each of these stories tell you about what helps in working with children? What do each of these tell you about what makes it hard to do really good child protection work with children? And what do each of these stories tell you about yourself and about what you value about working with children? Okay? So just take about five to seven minutes and have a conversation with your partner. Okay?
these are Aboriginal clapping sticks back from Australia that are used, um, Indigenous people use them in music and ceremonies and part of community ritual. So I brought these over as a gift to Phil in our working together. They're not quite as loud as that. It's a bit hard when people yeah. are talking, but yeah, yeah. yeah. nice. Yeah. Yeah. It worked. Yeah. Cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, yeah. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> All right, what, uh, I, won't, I won't subject you to my dancing. What, what, can we get like two or three thoughts from each of these just real quick? So what did you come up with for you guys in your work? What do these stories uh, tell you about what helps? What do these stories tell you about what's hard? Can we start with those? What's helped you in your work of engaging children and keeping children at the center of the work? You know what, actually, before I ask this, let's just ground this even just in a, in a quick thought. Um, Three things you need for a child welfare case. Three things without which you cannot have a child welfare case. What is the first? A child. A child. Okay? A plus, right? And yeah, it's a duh moment, I got it. But <laughs> there is so much that distracts us from that piece. There is so much about timelines, about compliance, about paperwork, about drama, whether it's drama at the family or drama in the office, right? There's so much that can make us forget this is about a child. And that's really how we've organized these two days, right? The other two things, by the way, a caregiver of some kind and a reportable concern, right? So three things, if you don't have them, you can't have some child welfare intervention. What did you come up with? What are the things that help you to keep the child at the center of your work? Now I'm going to bring the microphone here. Please don't let that stop you speaking out. <laughs> I think when we're working together in a group like this, so much of what we learn is from each other. So the comments you make can be someone else's aha moment. Yeah, so I think it's important that you get a chance to hear what someone else is saying. I know it's hard to have a microphone shoved in your face. Yeah. I'll try not to shove too hard. Yeah. In the back, Sonia. Oh. Thank you. Um, I was really struck by it's about relationships and it's about going wherever that kid, child needs you to go and going outside the box for that child and maintaining that relationship and understanding who that child is and what that child needs, what's important to that child. Thank you. Yeah. Nicely said. You know, thoughtful that we talk relationship, relationship about our adult clients a lot, but is it really any different with the kids? They're, they're smaller people, but that's still going to form the basis of us doing some work together. How do you make those relationships where we can have hard conversations about danger and safety? Yeah, thank you. What else helps you to keep the child at the center of your work? I know, I'm sorry. I would just say um, really listening and being present, I think is a big one for me. Yeah. She's fine, she's gonna go there. And for me, it's um, kind of knowing the child before I go out as an investigator, um, looking at when we last engaged with um, and the experience I shared was being able to tell that child, I know the things that you told the last investigator and I know what your fears are and this is what I need, your words are going to help me make a plan to help you. <laughs> and he was able to say what he needed to say this time. Okay, that's fabulous. So both um, making sure that we're really present, that we're not busy thinking into what's the next three appointments that I need to make, and also that when we know some of the history, that we can say, you know, we, we understand some of this, and maybe even check that out with the child. Here's what I understand. Um, how am I doing, you know? Yeah. So, um, kind of adding to that, just being aware of the cultural needs of the child, and. Um, Non-judgmental. Yeah. So that, um, as we all know, that culture mediates everything. That how a child even understands danger and safety, actions of their caregivers that might be harmful or complicating or you know just um, difficult, uh, is very much mediated through their own particular cultural lens. And so being aware of that, being being curious about that. Michael. Um, having your own children. Sorry, Mike. Just, 
We want to hear what you've got to say. Having your own children and seeing really the vulnerability of children and the need for safety and protection, and that really every child deserves that because they're all really so precious. That's the thing that centers me around looking at, you know, my job with children. And so for those of us who are parents in the room, or who have been parents, uh, being thoughtful about uh, those vulnerabilities, being able to keep our children with us sometimes is a way into this work. Uh, even if you're not a parent, thinking about the important children in your life, I think sometimes can do that also. Yeah. Yeah. Other things, just one or two that really help you in your work of keeping the children at the center. Just sort of piggybacking on that is, is remembering and recognizing that even though the child may be going through uh, whatever abuse is that that child loves and wants their, their parent. Yes. yes. And that for, for those of us that sometimes are new to the work or even when we've been in the work for a long time, it can be a hurdle to get over remembering that no matter how horrendous a parent has treated a child, that those are still those child's parents, and there often will be deep attachment there. Doesn't mean necessarily that that will work as a primary caregiver relationship, but recognizing that person's always going to be important in some way. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm a parent partner in Vernon City County, and so I'm kind of on the periphery in a lot of instances. And the one thing that I know in connecting with the kids that I work with through their families is to be genuine. And it's far more than being, I think, from being present. Thank you. Yeah. You know, the, uh, the temptation, I think, to want to keep kids safe can move us sometimes into this place of superficiality and a little uh, patronizing sometimes. Whereas, um, and you'll hear examples throughout the next two days about this, how do we recognize that this is the context of these children's lives and that actually um, some of our job, our most important job, is to really engage with radical curiosity about what they've been going through, what's it been like, and what are their ideas for making it better. That's really, God, if we could rewrite the description of this exactly. workshop, we should that would be really included nice. that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. What gets in the way? Just a couple. What gets in the way? Assumptions. assumptions. Can you say, hang on one sec, and then you want to say something about assumptions? It was over here. When I think about the children that, you know, when, I, when, when you ask about the kids that you worry about, I don't know, long list of them, I've been doing this for 45 years. So those are the children that I remember whenever I get frustrated or distressed. And, and when I think about it, it really has to do with um, assumptions, ignorance, um, not really understanding what was going on um, and just sort of going along with whatever the particular culture was then. And so what I'm hoping that one of the things that we get out of science and safety is that we question our own culture as well. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Thank you. Question some of our professional, our professional assumptions. Yeah. 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 One or two more. Things that get in the way. Yeah, Tom. Uh, going out of your comfort zone, I, I think back to one of my very first cases in Chihuahua in 1982 where I had a couple of boys and I, one of them I did not know, I was very inexperienced, did not know how to connect with this boy and he, he was angry and he was uh, kind of withdrawn and, and um, just very difficult for me and, I, and it was easier for me to interact with the adults in the picture mm -hmm. and that's what I that's what I gravitated toward. And I think back about that kid, and I, and I know that I did not help him in a way, any way that I could have helped him had I been more persistent and developed my skills further at that point in my career, if I'd had more developed skills that I could have um, intervened with him and, and really connected with him and find out what's, what his world was like from his point of view. I didn't have any idea, and I didn't have the skills at the time to to get that perspective. So, and I, mean, I think it's really important. That kid ended up in prison. You know, for he did a stint in prison and came out and did okay, but it, that's not something I, I, I just worry about that. 
You know, um, thank you. Childhood, you, this, is, this is maybe a little, bit, a little bit of an odd image, but I'll offer it for what it's worth. You could think about childhood almost like a culture in and of itself. It's got its own rituals. It's got its own norms, right? You would never go and sit with a, an adult uh, and expect them to go squirming under the table and through chairs and close their eyes, you know, unless, unless you were dealing with a very significantly mentally ill population. But that's often the norm for children. So many of my interviews with children have taken place under dining room tables, <laughs> you know, on the floor, spread out and, you know, all fours, you know, playing with fire trucks or whatever, you know. And so, um, how do we think about engaging in what I'm calling the, the culture of childhood? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. We're going to push on. I'd like to invite you a couple things. One is, you know, there's probably a lot more we could have surfaced about what works for you and what gets in the way. I want you to hold on to that as we go through these two days and think about how what we present matches into what you already do and what you want to do about what you value. The other thing is I just want you to hold on to those two names that you wrote down. And we're going to come back to them. But I want you, if you can, to be thinking about those two kids as you think about these practices and think about what, what kind of difference this would have made for them. So, yeah. Oh, you don't need this. Yeah. Don't need that one. Yeah. So yeah, we, we wanted to start with bringing those children into the room, you know, and really grounding us in um, memories and, and visions and hopes about the children that we work with. So we're going to move a little bit now. We're going to come back to working with children after lunch. We're going to move a little bit now. Um, and Phil and I just talked about an idea I had. Um, a way of trying to help, particularly those people who are in the room and new to the signs of safety approach. We want to try and land some of the tools and processes that we're going to be introducing over these two days or um, deepening the understanding for some people, trying to kind of land those in an overview from when we first start working with the family right through to when we close the case. And try and picture and locate where are the, the tools and processes we're going to be offering over these two days. Where do they kind of fit? Yeah? So I just want to start, just do a little bit kind of a physical thing with this. This isn't a very Australian thing to do, so if you can just bear with me around this. Okay, so I want you for a moment, imagine the moment that we start working with a family. Yeah? Might be a phone intake, it might be a referral that's come from an agency, it might be someone arriving at the office and saying, take my child, I'm done. Whatever that moment is, the moment we start working with a family. Yeah, you got that in mind? I need someone who will come out the front here and use their body, not in any kind of extreme way, I'm not from New Zealand, um, and physically just come and be that, just kind of take up that space. Can someone do that? I'm not going to make you do anything other than stand here. Thank you so much. Come on down. Okay, so just, just to physically locate, here's the moment we're starting working with a family. <laughs> Are you kind of feeling a little stressed, a little frustrated, a little like, oh, this is the moment, you know, it might be a whole lot of anxiety that's going on, a whole lot of grief. Go. Just be it. Just kind of take it up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Okay. 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 The moment when we close the case. Assessment's been made. There's enough safety for this child, these children, and we are closing the case. Who's always wanted to be that moment? <laughs> yeah. Someone, if you can just come and be that moment here. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> so now, as we know, that doesn't tend to happen so quickly. So you're going to need to come on over here with me. <laughs> bit of a way, bit of a distance. How far am I going to get her to move? Okay. You're the moment. Okay, the moment when the case is closed. The moments we want, yeah? Okay. All right, so... Talking about some of the processes and tools we're going to be looking at today, the signs of safety approach has, who's seen the signs of safety framework? Okay, that might be the, the four quad map that Phil has introduced to people here. It might be the signs of safety three column framework, which is what I use all the time. It might be the original signs of safety framework as Steve and Andrew developed it with workers back in the early 90s. It's all the same. 
It's just laid out differently. Yeah? But that's the signs of safety framework. Now, we're not going to be looking at that in detail over these two days, but I kind of want to locate you. So can someone come and be that framework? Take it up. Be the framework. I just need you to physically come out. Be here. Someone jump up. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Okay, here's the signs of safety framework. Tom, you're doing a beautiful job. Have you ever seen such a, a very clear, <laughs> insightful, reflective signs of safety framework? Okay, just for a moment, thinking about the, the time when we're first opening a case, <laughs> when are we going to use the signs of safety framework? Come on over here, Tom. Right. How close? How close are we talking here? Pretty close. Okay. All right. When else? Yeah. Punch up over there. When else are you going to be using the signs of safety framework? All the way through. All the way through. All the way. No, you're still the moment the case begins. You don't get to move. You're going with him. Okay. So all the way along, yeah? So the framework's being used all the way along. Okay, so feel free, Tom, you just hang wherever you want now. You get to move if you want. You're kind of fluid, flexible. A dynamic process in action, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah, but we sometimes do, hey. We sometimes do. We sometimes do go backwards. Okay, engaging a child. It might be that you're using the three houses tool. Who wants to be the three houses tool? Nikki Weld would be proud of you. Someone, Michael, is that something you're bursting to do? To be the, I thought so. I could see it on your face. Yeah. Okay. Three houses tool. When's the moment you're going to use the three houses tool? Head on over this way. Okay. How close to the beginning? Very beginning. So you're wanting to be talking. <laughs> you're feeling a little calmer now? A little. A little. Okay. So you're wanting to be talking with the child, hearing the child's views, helping the child understand about why we're now in their life, way early on. Where else are you going to use a three houses tool? In the middle, maybe. Yeah? Just say a little bit more, just out loud. In the middle? Yeah? And then down there? Yeah? Okay. So yeah, for some people, it makes really good logical sense. You want to be talking with a child here in the, in the beginning. You want to check in, kind of in the middle of the work with the child, get their views. And again, toward the end, checking in, how's the child feeling? Is the child feeling safe enough? We've made a decision we think it's safe enough to close the case. Does the child agree? Where else might you be using the three houses? Court, court yep. Yeah. At the court process? Yeah. And can I just offer you the suggestion, everywhere else in between. Every moment where you think, hmm, what does a child think about that? Is a child understanding actually what's going on? We're about to embark on safety planning. Has this child got any idea of what we're talking about when we talk about safety planning? Or there's about to be a change of placement? Or you're about to commence overnight stays? What's the child's feelings, views about all of that? So yeah, there's many, many moments. Okay, someone needs to be the moment we go and talk with the parents. That very first conversation, <laughs> I heard that little snigger. <laughs> Someone, if you could just come. Thank you, Mike. Okay, where's this moment happening? <laughs> All right, so right in the beginning, where else? All the way along. Okay, just, I mean, just kind of wanting to physically represent that these are dynamic processes. They're not static one-off events. We're talking about ongoing conversations that are very purposeful. What's our purpose in every single conversation we're having here? What's our purpose? Check in. Check in. Safety. safety. Checking in about safety. What's our purpose here? What are we checking in about safety for? For the child, what do we want to know? Is there enough safety for this child to be home, for us to close the case? At every single moment, every conversation, they're all very purposeful conversations. And so these two days, what we're going to focus in on is the talking with the child. Is that you, Michael? Were you the talking? 
Yeah. yeah. Sorry. No, sorry. We didn't do, <laughs> no, I don't think yeah. we did a talking to the child. Yeah. Sorry? We didn't, I don't think. Did, no, three houses we did. Michael, was that right? you? Were you the he three, was three houses? houses. Yeah. 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 You're kind of just looking so serious there. We didn't get it. Yeah, get <laughs> under that table there. So we're going to be looking at the three houses. We're going to be looking at tools and processes for engaging with parents and helping parents to be right in the middle of this work that we're doing. Yeah? And we're also going to be looking at the process of safety planning. And what we're talking about is long-term safety planning, not just the immediate plans of is there enough child for the safety for the child tonight, long-term detailed safety plans that leads everyone to a level of confidence that we can close the case and these kids will be safe. Okay, who wants to be the safety plan? I just need one more body. You have to be pretty detailed. You're going to have to be pretty vibrant. You're going to need to be meaningful. <laughs> Lots of people are, exactly. So someone can just jump up quickly. Sakura, would you like to thank you? Okay, so safety planning. Here's the moment we start working with the family. The other end is the moment where we are confident there's enough that this safety plan is going to deliver enough safety to close the case. Where are you starting the safety planning process? Where do you want me to put her? At the, begin at the beginning. How close? Okay, so safety planning process is starting from the moment you start working with the family. The very first moment. Our focus is on future safety. And what I've learned is the earlier we do that, the more quickly we close cases, the more quickly we can get out of families' lives because every bit of focus, every bit part of our work is focused on building enough safety within the family for us to close the case. Yep. So safety planning process is starting here. That's the other thing we're going to be focusing on, on the, these two days is some ideas, some suggestions, drawing on your ideas, offering some from other parts of the world about how to do comprehensive safety planning with families that starts at the beginning and does it end at this point? At what point does the safe... So, Cora, if you do mind What point... <laughs> You've got to be alive, girl. You've got to be alive. At what point does the safety planning process finish? Adulthood. Ad yeah, <laughs> adulthood. Adulthood. So we're closing the case, our job's finished here, and the network and the family are continuing to use this safety plan for as long as it's needed for the child, which in some cases is adulthood. Yeah? And then some. And then some, absolutely. So thank you so much. Woo! So yeah, we just wanted to locate that physically to help you. So if, as Phil said earlier, if you are, as we're introducing some of these tools and processes, kind of thinking, how does that fit? For example, with the detailed signs of safety framework, just hold those thoughts to Wednesday, Thursday, and, if, and hopefully that's helpful for you to think about where it's kind of located in there. We did want to say something quickly about the maps, and I think you yeah. were going to say a little bit? Or I think yours is up first. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I'm not going to say a lot. This is um, the four quadrant safety map that we have used mostly in Massachusetts. Um, you'll notice it's based on three critical questions. And they are the same three critical questions. If you've been in trainings with me, you know them. If you've heard them, Andrews talks about them. They form the basis for the practice. They form the basis of inquiry. We could have brought someone up here to be the three questions. And they would have been also throughout the life of the case. What are we worried about? What's working well? And what needs to happen? Right? That this is a way of just beginning to organize us, beginning to make sense of information. You go out on a home visit, you are filled with sights and sounds and smells and tactile and stories and conflicting stories. And how do we as professionals, but also we as a community, begin to navigate this? We start with some simple schemas that help us to organize information. Anyone who's done child welfare has for years, you have your schema. This isn't meant to replace that. This is in addition to that. Right? And it's one that we can put on the kitchen table 
with families and begin to surface their ideas and help them come on a journey so that maybe they can begin to organize information and understand it too. What are you worried about in your family, if anything? What do you see going well, if anything, in your family? What do you think needs to happen, right? So it's a space for a shared dialogue. In the framework in Massachusetts, in this four quadrant map, we took this critical question, we landed it front and center in the map, and we made sure we were always thinking about it. What is the caregiver's impact on the child? A lot of things happen in these families that we wish could be otherwise. For it to be child welfare work, for it to be at the center of what we do, we want to always be thinking about what was the caregiver behavior what was the impact on the child. And again, for those of you who are new to this map, we will cover it in great detail towards the end of the week. But this is the beginning of kind of that organization. Right? The three column map is not a different map. It is the same map. Yeah. Same three questions. Yeah. Thank you. So just a really quick blurb. Who's seen the original signs of safety form? If you've read the book, you'll see the original form. What happened was Andrew took that into New Zealand to train the Kiwis and they all said, that's a very complex looking official form. I'm not putting that on the table with families. And um, through that process, they were able to ask Andrew questions to identify what are the three, what are the critical bits? What are the critical domains you're talking about there? And of course they are, as Phil was saying, I'm so good with this. I'm really skilled. <laughs> what are you worried about? What's working well? What needs to happen? And the fourth, of course, which is the judgment scale. The judgment about how much safety is there for the children in the caregiver's care right now, that we're representing as a scale, zero to 10. So the, the Kiwis were able to ask the questions and then it became three columns which is what I use all the time. And up until recently, I've always trained both maps, the original map and the three columns. Um, and seeing what Massachusetts have done in terms of taking the same information, just locating it slightly differently, I've kind of thought, I'm going to drop off the original map. I never use it. No one I know uses it. I'm actually just dropping it off. But it is exactly the same form. And I think that as practitioners, what we need to do is find what fits best with our practice with our way of working and find what fits best with each family that we work with. So you use the form that fits best with you and fits into your practice context. Yeah, yeah. and I'm thoughtful actually about the word form, you know, and, and some of you have heard me say this, but when you look at the framework, whether it's the three column or the four quad, it looks like a form, sounds like a form, <laughs> smells like a form, it's way worse than a form. It's a way of thinking, right? It's a way of practice. The form is an organizing process that helps us to manage information, to work our way through with families. But what's much more important is to begin to think about this as a way of guiding your thinking, your uh, conversations, and your questions. Yeah. 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 the quadrants for staffings and then we use this out in the field and for family team meetings because yeah. it flows a little easier yes, yes. and the, the quadrants help us really devise uh, or define um, whether we're gonna, where we're going to go next but really helps us to problem solve it's yeah. a little more clear. Yeah. Um, so I guess that works, right? It doesn't matter if you use one or the other. Like you were saying, you were using this form and you need to let go of that. Yeah. But it seems to be working for our agency, and um, I don't know, I like it that way. So. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's yeah. I, I, to me, they're all organized around the three questions, and then it's like what will help the group you're with move forward in thinking through the question of impact? and in thinking through the question of what will make more safety for the children. And so there are times, like when I start with families, I start with the three questions, you know? 
And then sometimes I will bring them through the four quadrant, and I'll tell a story tomorrow about kind of explaining the definitions to family and us doing the sort with families. I think there are some families I can do that with. There are some families where just the three questions are enough to begin to take us down the road towards us all thinking together. So I, I think these are the kinds of innovations you can share with each other. Where are the places you're using the four quad map? Where are the places you're using the three column? Mm, yeah. mm, absolutely. And different, sorry, you go. It doesn't matter whether you start with the what you're worried about yeah, or what's worth question. Beautiful question. Beautiful question. question. One of the things we're going to come straight to after morning tea, actually, you know, were we going to give them morning tea today? Or we did we decide no morning tea I today? didn't think they were getting a break all no, day. No, I think yeah, so. No? Yeah. Yeah. We thought no breaks today and then you can finish early. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, straight after morning tea, what, we were, what we're going to do is actually just do some demonstration around, in my way of working, for example, how do I bring the science of safety framework to families, whichever form you're using, and, and where do we start? And often when I'm training people, it's one of the key questions people ask is, how do you bring it to families? Where do you start? Like, which bit do I start with? We're going to try it out in different ways and show you what it's like and get you exploring what it's like. Uh, scale. What, uh, what's the number? How do you come up with that number? The zero to ten. Do you mean as a as a family member or as a worker? How do you come up with that number? Or did you mean? I'm talking about where yeah. judgment, where you have judgment. How yeah. do you yeah. come up with that number? The the number on the scale where you choose. So, the safety scale. Let me thank you. Good question. Let me just give you a tiny bit more information about what makes up the framework. Those are the four key domains. You'll see all the headings that are underneath. Now, this is in your handouts, and there's also some more detailed information in your handouts about taking you through each part of the framework. From both, Phil's done that in terms of the four quad map, and I've done that in terms of the three column. So you'll see the headings there under the what are we worried about. It's broken into some different elements. It's about analysing the information and making sense of the information. The past harm. What's happened to the kids in the past that worries us? What has happened to these children or any children in the care of these caregivers that concerns us? Yep, that's the past harm. The complicating factors are what is all the stuff that's going on in this family's life and in our work with this family that makes it more difficult for us to work together and get the business of keeping the kids safe in place? What's all that complicating stuff? Which often is what our child protection work gets caught up in. I was working with a family very recently. They asked me as a consultant to come to work with an Aboriginal mum and dad, who were grandparents, sorry, in their 50s, who had, their granddaughter had been in their care since she was a baby. It's very common in Aboriginal culture for grandparents to be caring for children if there's, you know, mum and dad both had um, substance use issues. The granddaughter had been in their care since birth and she was removed about a year ago um, because of some past allegations that surfaced around sexual abuse of a niece, allegations of sexual abuse of the niece by the granddad. And so the child was removed and the parents were, going, were being taken to court by the department for permanent orders to be in place. And the family asked me, would I work with these, the lawyers actually asked me, would I work with these parents to help them map the case? And I've never been asked that before. I was kind of like, Sure, let's see how useful that is. And we went all the way through the court process and the parents, the grandparents, sorry, really thought it through. They organised all of their thinking using this framework to be able to say to the magistrate, this is what we think we need to do, both to keep our granddaughter safe and to show the department that we can do that and get the department out of our life and get our granddaughter back where she needs to be. Um, and what was interesting was seeing these parents really make sense of all of that and them kind of go, you know what, for the last 18 months we've just been arguing about complicating factors. That's it. We haven't even been arguing about the important stuff. It was really amazing seeing people just make sense of that and just move straight forward to what needs to happen. So you'll see, I won't go through it in much more detail now, but it's divided into elements and one of those key domains is looking at all of that information, reflecting on what we're worried about and what we understand or know is working well in the family, then making an assessment, a judgement of how much safety at this point in time do I think there is for this child right now? 
And that's, I think, one of the most difficult questions as child protection workers that we face. That's where the problem is. And what people love about this approach and what people hate about this approach is that it gets that out in the open. It asks you as a worker, you as a supervisor, you as a mum, a child, a grandma, to actually name up how safe do you think it is right now for this child? And that's, as I said, a really difficult question to answer, but one that we actually need to just develop the practice and the discipline and the courage to speak out and risk being wrong. Because what I love about this scale is that it's a scale. There's no right or wrong. It's about your view right now. So it's a scaling question on a scale from zero to 10, where 10 is this child could be at home and I would feel that they are completely and 100% safe. And zero is I don't think this child could be at home. Where am I? Where is Sonia? Where is my supervisor? Where is the parent? Where is the child, right? And that that's a first step in us beginning to have a very difficult conversation about, well, I think there are seven. Where do you think they are? About a three. Yeah, well, can you help me understand why you're at a three? Because I'm really feeling pretty good about this, right? And so we can begin to have a conversation to think this through together. And we can do that with the parent, too. Yeah. yeah. And what's lovely is when you see different people's views represented and people are in different places. At that point, I always celebrate. I get much more worried when everyone's at a seven or everyone's at a nine. I really celebrate that when you see that difference because what that creates is an opportunity for dialogue. Hearing each other's points of view, hearing each other's reasons. And once you s people get more practiced at doing that, it really opens up the possibility to have that dialogue in really constructive ways. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to take a break. I, I saw a hand up. Is this, do you, is a, a, I can wait, you're good with it waiting? Okay, um, let's take a 10 minute break. When we come back, here's the teaser. Um, you're gonna watch Sonia do this with a family, all right? So come back in 10 minutes, all right? Do we want to get them reading Chloe, or did you want to do some, something else first? I'll do a quick intro to okay. it. Yeah, is that okay. okay? Yeah. Now, where did my pen go, honey? Did you see where my pen went? There's a pen oh, yeah, right there. beautiful. Beautiful. We're going to get started. Um, uh, what we're going to do in just a second, Sonia's going to give you a... Uh, You're going to need the mic. Please. Do I need the mic? Yeah. Okay. What we're going to do, what we're going to do in a second is um, uh, we're going to introduce you to a family that Sonia's worked with. Um, can prep you ahead of time. We are looking for a couple of volunteers to enroll as this family. I know everyone loves role plays. Um, but I think it's the best way really to get a, a sense of how these questions in action really move. And so be thinking about uh, a couple of brave souls who would be willing to come down and, and enroll as the parents. But we'll let Sonia walk you through the, um, the family and give you an introduction in a second. Can I just check in in the back? How are we doing with feedback on this mic? Doing okay so far? You let us know if it gets bad, okay? I just set my mic up. Okay. The battery went flat. How's that? Is that volume okay? Yeah, cool. Okay, so yeah, what we thought we'd do now is actually do a bit of a demonstration of me doing my best shot in the moment of talking with a family, talking with a mum and a dad. We're going to use a case example for a family that I've worked with. And I just want to step you through how I might in the moment start a conversation with that mum and dad, bringing the signs of safety framework to them to help us organise our thinking, our conversation together, our focus on the child and safety for the child. Um, 
So this is a family I worked with, mum and a dad, about 8 o'clock last night, I said to Phil, I'm sorry I haven't done that genogram for the family and I thought it's not going to happen. So there is no genogram if I can just really quickly speak you through it because I forgot to do the genogram. So mum and a dad, um, mum's Tina, about 25, dad's Jason, 28, this is their first child, Chloe who's seven days old. Now mum and dad have been in a relationship for about two years. As I said, this is their first child. Chloe was born at hospital and two days after birth she was transferred to the intensive care unit at our children's hospital with respiratory distress. So Chloe's been in, in the children's hospital now for five days and the hospital social worker has been working with mum and dad and some concerns have been identified and the hospital have sent a referral through to child protection and I've got it. Yep, so as the intake worker, I'm now going to meet with that family. The first thing I did was have a conversation with the hospital social worker. So, sorry, first thing I did was read the referral, obviously, that she had faxed through to us once the case was allocated to me. So I've read the referral through and I started to organise my thinking about the information I'd been given by kind of starting to map it out in the signs of safety framework. So that's what I did, just literally, big sheet of paper, sorry, just, sorry, just A4 piece of paper, I just drew two lines down and started to put the information into the framework to help me organise my thinking about what was going on for Chloe. Then I phoned the hospital social worker and I asked her some further questions about information that she hadn't thought to include. By putting it in the framework, it highlighted for me where the gaps were. And I started to straight away think about what questions do I want to ask to get more information here. Once I was satisfied, I knew everything that work, the hospital social worker was able to tell me. Again, I just looked at what I'd mapped out, I refined it. What I was doing at that point is just mapping my thinking about what I knew at that point, very early point, just what I knew. What I then did is print that out, so I had a copy of it to take to the family with me, and I put that in my bag. So I've got that with me as I'm talking to the family, but I'm not going to start with that. Okay? The first thing I'm going to do is, after I've introduced myself, is try and understand the family's views. Try and elicit as much as I can from them about what is going on in their family. So I'm going to try and create an environment where they're willing to talk with me. And at that point I'm then going to share my views that I've mapped out, which of course will have changed because I've just heard new information from the family. So what we're going to do here is actually step that through. Now what you've got is my initial mapping. Page one and page three and four in the handout, you've got my initial mapping. Okay, about the what are we worried about, what's working well, and the scaling of the hospital social worker at that point, where she scaled things. And what I forgot to include on there, I realised yesterday, was actually my scaling. Because I also scaled at that point myself. And I scaled it at somewhere between a two and a three. It's my best memory at this point. So what I'm going to ask you to do is just have a read through of that, just that initial information, so that you've got that as a basis for us going forward with this role play. Can I also then keep asking you to keep thinking about someone to come and step into being this mum? at this point in time and someone to come and step into being the dad. Been secretly thinking about coming up here and being part of the role play. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Did you want to be the mum or the dad? You mean... <laughs> you get to choose because you're the first. You'll be the mum? Cool. Thank you. So if we could have someone who's willing to come up and be dad. Thank you. Thanks very much. We get a quick round of applause for yeah. our brave volunteer. Okay.
Here's what I'd like you to do um, around this. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Signs of Safety is built a lot Thank on you. the best oh, of yeah. solution focused interviewing. Solution focused interviewing has a very strong belief that questions are not just a way that you get information, but questions are an intervention. They do something, right? A question that gathers data, what's your favorite color? You tell me your favorite color's blue. I know your favorite color's blue. It's a simple data gathering question. A solution focused question. How did you take that step? Who are the people that stood with you when you did that? What makes it hard to do it more often? Those are questions not just for me to learn something. I'm trying to make you think, right? And so what I want you to do is I want you to take a piece of paper and draw a line down it. And I want you to begin to or enhance your ability to really be students of good questions. That's a part of this practice, is to become a student of really good questions. And so it's going to be very tempting, team, it's going to be very tempting when you listen to the role play to focus only on the content. So, you know, they're going to have the rules of improvisation. So if Jason says, you know, nothing's been the same since I was captured by those aliens back in 75, you know, that's what the content's going to be. They're going to move into that, right? I don't want you to get too distracted by the content. Try to study Sonia's questions. What does she ask? What happens? What do you think would happen? Is it something you could ask? What would you like about it? What you couldn't? So try to capture her questions, OK? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to time them out every once in a while and give us a chance to talk, to reflect, and maybe ask you guys some questions. So I'm going to be doing the same thing. I'm going to be trying to track her questions. Okay. And for people at the back, this is going to be pretty hard for you to stay engaged and focused, perhaps. So if you want to move your chairs forward, do that. Even if you start off and you want to move, you won't interrupt us. So just make sure that this is the best learning experience for you. So you do what you need to do to make sure that this works as well as possible for you. Yeah, so feel free. You can bring a chair up or you can stand up here on the side, whatever, whatever you'd like. Um, because of the way the screen is with the camera, we're not going to leave the screen on. What I was going to put up there was the signs of safety framework. So we're kind of focused without that. But if you can just, just as a start, move to the framework in your handouts. And what I want to start by saying is, in part in response to the great question that was asked earlier about which part of the framework do you start with when we're starting to have this conversation with families? Can I just check in with people? As you have used the Signs of Safety framework with families, what have you learnt about the best place to start? Just a couple of thoughts from people. Am I on? I'm not on. Depends on where the family is, we have found. Yeah. Depending on what's going on, and it might work better to ask them what's been working well and it might be better to go straight into what are we worried about. So depending on where the family is? Yep. And what, what are the indicators to you that tells you where the family is? Their body language, their, um, the interaction they may have already had with the social worker. And what, what would be to you, I guess, a sign that would say, actually I'm going to start with what's working well here? We can get a sense that they are engaged in what we're about to um, do with them in the safety mapping. Okay. That's a good okay. indication. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Other people, what have you learned? Sakura? There's also a, in that point in, if they're tense and just agitated that we're there, it's always kind of good to start with what's working well to engage and build a core um, before you lead into the serious components. Yeah. Now, Try and imagine for a moment a family member, a mom and a dad, and we've got Tina and Jason right here, are in the room as we're having this conversation about, well, if they're a little tense, we're going to start off with what's working well, just to try and engage them and build a bit of rapport. Imagine how a mum and dad might, might hear that from us. What do you think their likely response would be? They, they want 
happy as I've been on <coughs> Sorry? If I'm doing so well, why are we having this conversation? Yeah, yeah, if I'm doing so well, why are we having this conversation? Yeah? And I guess I'm also just mindful straight away that we th we're using the language around building rapport and engaging with families. And sorry, that wasn't this, this is not a criticism because I'm using that language too. Just always, I try and remember, put myself in a family's member's shoes and we're talking about, we're going to tell them what we think we're doing well to try and build a bit of rapport. And they can feel like, and I heard this expression from a woman, a mum in Minnesota, which was, you're just blowing smoke up my ass. You know, that sense of, you know, yeah, yeah, you're just trying to stroke me really nicely, so I'll do what you want, can often be what parents have said to me. So what we need to make sure is that when we are acknowledging what parents are doing well, we're, do it, we're being as real and genuine as possible. Yeah, not blowing smoke up someone's ass, And not just trying to, because, you know, you can compliment someone in a way that feels pretty superficial, and you watch parents kind of just flick that right off. So I guess I'm just inviting you at this point, to, as, as I'm doing this today, notice, notice the questions and also notice the compliments I use. And do a bit of reflecting about which are the ones that you notice make a difference and help to build a space where we can talk together. Yeah? Mike? It might feel a little, it might feel a little condescending to them. Here we are, and you got the power. Yeah. Uh, what's working well for you? Exactly. What well, yeah. would be working well for me if they get out of this room? If you like, just get right out of here, <coughs> yeah. Or if I just leaned over and took your head off, would work very well for me. Exactly. So, um, just I guess just to hold that as you're working with families would be an invitation. Okay. Now. What I've said to both Tina and Jason in this role is that they can ad lib. So any information they, that's not in the, the um, initial mapping you've got, they can make up. So if they're saying things you're thinking, hang on, where is that? It's probably not there and that's okay because the, the, the content stuff's not important, it's the process that we're focused on. Hi, I'm, I'm Sonia Parker, and Madeline, who was here earlier. Your, your mic cut, I think your mic oh, cut out. Sorry, is my mic on? Please make sure you remind me. What I'll tend to do is my voice will drop. I do it every single time okay. I do demonstrations. Give me a minute. I'll just move the mic back up. Please interrupt if it happens, because yep. it will for sure. How's that now? If I just go down to a talking volume, is that OK? Still at the back? Cool. Tina, Jason, hi, I'm Sonia Parker. Madeline um, said to me that she'd explain to you, need volume more? A more. Ah, thank you. Thank you. When I slip from trainer role straight into working with families, I'm just like, okay, I'm just focused on the family now. All right, how's that now? When I that's uh, better. Okay. okay. Madeline said to me that she'd explain to you both that I'm, I'm from child protection, mm -hmm. and that she sent a referral through to us yesterday. Mm -hmm. As you know, so um, I imagine I'm probably the last person you want to be talking to, but I appreciate you taking the time to come in and sit down with me. So let me just explain a little bit about why I'm here. Yeah. Can I ask you first, what did Madeline tell you about why she'd sent a referral through to us? Um, she said that you um, were worried that we wouldn't be good parents. Okay. And that hurt her. Yes. Jess, can you? What did Madeline say to you? Uh, you um, thought we really weren't acting very good in the hospital and uh, so we worried about what we do. Okay. So this is the first time I've met you both. You know, I don't know anything yet about who you are as a mum and a dad and who you're going to be. I was really sorry to hear that Chloe had been having those breathing problems. I imagine it's not been an easy week for you guys. Um, 
So now you've got child protection on top of that that you've got to be dealing with and I'm going to do my best job to, to make this process, which is a really difficult process. I'm going to do my best to just make this as easy for you as possible. Okay, I'm going to be straight with you. If I'm worried about something, I'm going to tell you. I'm not going to bullshit you. I'm going to speak straight. I hope you'll feel able to do the same back. If I'm doing something that's making it hard for you, you tell me. Yep, I'm going to, I'm going to hear that. Now, we got a referral from the hospital telling us... I'm sorry, I'm just going to pause you. What did she just do? She, she, made, she made some agreements. Okay? I'm going to be as straight with you as possible. And I, if you have a question, you know, like I want you to answer, I want you to call me on it, okay? So I just want to bring it home to where we started today. They weren't agreements on a formal PowerPoint that she passed out to them, but she made some initial working agreements and she got a nod that yes, okay, I, I, I at least understand that. Um, and so then they're in a position to begin doing some work. Can I just um, ask people to, to notice one other thing I did that I always do that I think makes a difference anyway, which was I just acknowledged how bloody hard this is. You know, it's probably I'm the last person you want to deal with. Yeah. Um, and, and did you hear me say something about Chloe? Yeah? Sorry you were the sugar yeah, sorry to hear what's been happening. I wanted to bring Chloe here into the room and honour them as parents, that they are her parents, as quickly as possible. Yeah. Um, so let me just explain a little bit then about we got a referral from the hospital. They sent it through to us yesterday. I know Chloe's been here for five days in, in the hospital. Um, and the, the, we got a referral through where the hospital worker said to me, sorry, hospital social worker Madeline, said to me, there are a whole number of things that they'd seen that they really were impressed with with you as new parents. And there were some, some things they've seen that are really worrying them. Now, I'm not going to pretend I've got really much of an idea at the moment about whether Chloe will be safe going home with you guys or <coughs> not. That's what I'm here to talk with you about. But what I do know is that the hospital's got some things they're worried about and we have to take it seriously. Do they think I made her sick? The, some of the doctors have said very clearly to the, to the social worker who spoke to me that they don't actually know that. They can't say categorically whether her respiratory problem is because of something that you've both done or not. But, that, but it's enough that there's a bit of a question in their mind, but no one's saying that they think that's your fault or not. And the baby wasn't hot, hot or anything right? No, she wasn't. There's no, the, 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 the tox screens, and you know that, hey? The doctors have spoken to you about that. Okay, okay, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. Now, one of the things that's, that I, want, I guess I wanted to say to you guys is that we have to take this seriously. Um, we get reports all the time of babies who get really seriously hurt. I don't think there's any parent who wants to hurt their baby, but parents, babies get hurt sometimes. Now, I'm not for a moment saying that that's what I think is going to happen for Chloe, but we know it happens. I mean, imagine you guys, have you seen some of the reports in the newspapers about babies that do get hurt in families? I've, I've seen it, but I wouldn't hurt my baby. Phil, could you just check out with the mic? How are people going in terms of hearing mum and dad? Any, you're not hearing? No, sorry, we'll just get the mic sorted. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know why. Sorry, we're going to not have the volume for mum and dad. Sorry. Do you know what? You may need to pass your lapel mic yeah. back and forth. I'll do that, hey? <laughs> oh, wait, I got it. Oh, you got it? Yo. Okay. okay. Beautiful. Well done. Thank you. So Jason, you say, so you were saying you've seen, you know, you've seen this, the report sometimes in the newspapers about babies that get injured and sometimes even die. I've seen that, and I wouldn't hurt my baby. Um, she couldn't even go home with me, and now you guys want to take her away from me. I don't understand that. So, so at no point am I saying to you 
that we've made a decision to take your baby away. That's not a decision that, that's going to be made until we've had lots of conversations. Yeah? What I want to do is explain to you about how that decision gets made and make sure that all of your thoughts about who you are as parents, who you're going to be as parents, are in as part of this decision. Because I can't make that decision without you both talking to me and helping me understand what's happening in your family, what's going to happen in your family with Chloe. Yeah? Well, maybe you can help, help by telling us uh, what part of, we're, of what we're doing is a big deal. Yeah, sure, absolutely. No problems at all. And I want to tell you some of that stuff and I want to ask you guys a lot of questions. Now, when I work with families, I'm going to, I ask a lot of questions. I'm going to be asking you guys a lot of questions. It's going to drive you mad, okay? I'm going to keep asking you questions because I've got to understand what's going on. I don't know what's happening in your family, okay? I've worked with lots of families, but I've never worked with you. I don't know Chloe yet. I haven't even had a chance to meet her yet. I hope after we've had a chance to talk, I can do that. If you, if you guys are willing, if you let me meet your little girl. But I'm going to be asking you a mountain of questions, drive you mad. And what I would ask of you is that you give me as much information as you're willing to. Now, if there's something that you don't want to tell me, and that, you know, that happens in families, stuff that you, that you don't feel so good about right now, that you find it in you to tell me anyway. All of us have times in our lives where we're not able to, to maybe be the, the person we want to be, the parent we want to be. We all have difficult times. Yep. My job is to sit here with you both, try and understand what's happening, and if there are problems, yeah, if there's stuff going on in your life right now that's going to make things hard for you to be the mum, the dad you want to be for Chloe, my job is to work with you and sort those problems. Sort those problems so that Chloe can be home with you and you can be the parent you want to be to her. That's my job. But that's going to involve us working together, hey? I can't do that on my own and I certainly don't want to be in a place where I'm making a decision that it's not yet safe for Chloe to be home with you. Best, best outcome is going to be Chloe gets to go home with you but we're going to have to work together to work out what needs to happen for her to be able to go home with you? Yeah. I've done okay. stuff that I'm not proud of, but I, I, since I knew that I was going to have a baby and be a mom, I've been trying to change that. So and if you're willing... I'm keeping her safe. Okay. And if you're willing to really help me understand that, that's going to make a huge difference for us to be able to talk that through together. Yeah. Okay. Can, Can I... Can I pause you for a sec? Yeah, sure. Um, one is, I think we're still having trouble with this. <sighs> Yeah, I think you're, you're going to have to pass the lapel mic. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, that's just not working. Um, what are you seeing happening here? What, what would you call what Sonia is doing? So rapport. Okay. What other words would you use? It's a good word. So building some rapport. Engaging. Engaging. Yep. Empathizing. Empathizing. Yep. Joining. Addressing the anxiety. Yep. 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 Um, what we're looking for here is for people to be able to fully participate, Thank you. right? Because the way you're going to get the best information and the way you're going to get uh, folks to be motivated is if they can be, where we talked about it with kids, as fully present as possible. It's hard for people to participate if they don't understand the process. And so in addition to all the things you said, I actually think she's also providing a mini orientation. I'm going to ask you a lot of questions. I'm not making a decision today. I can't make a decision without you, right? And so she's really trying to provide some context that I think is going to allow the family to have a shot at participating, right? And it's not a guarantee that it's going to work. They could still land in, a, in an angry place. But I, I really want to stress you can't participate if you don't understand what's happening, right? And so I think that's a lot of what's happening right now. Can I just add to that? Yeah. I really love the partnership and how you, um, you're building that by asking them to be a part of the decision making mm -hmm. and asking them to, um, uh, like you say, it's my job. My job, is, my job is to work with you to solve these problems, work together. And I, I love that partnership and I think that's huge. 
So my yeah. job is, for, is to help create a context where we can work together to solve these problems, right? So really setting that as the tone, yeah? Like the way she keeps bringing Chloe back into it, so it's not about them, it's about their child yes. and their family. Yeah. Have you noticed yet, though, that I'm the one doing the most of the talking at this point? And I'm, I'm, I'm starting to get a little bit uncomfortable with that. Yeah? So I'm kind of wanting to hand it over as quickly as possible. But I, what I know is that I have to talk a bit at the beginning so they get a sense of who I am. I'm asking people to trust me without them knowing who I am. So everything I'm saying is giving this mum and dad a little glimpse of who is this person that they're working with and can they trust me enough to start to open up. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, there was one question I'm just there. When I go out to the hospital on something, I don't sit down with both parents. I mean, I would if I'm having an introduction, but this isn't your, your whole interview, right? Then you're going to take in each parent individually and then talk to them? Or? Some, sometimes I am. Sometimes I am. If, but if I'm going to do that, and I've done that in the hospital too, if I'm going to do that, I'm going to first of all meet with them together. Yeah. Do you want to yeah. say why that's important to Yeah, you? sure. So um, right now, there's been not significant harm to Chloe, that we're not trying to have a forensic interview here. I'm not trying to identify, has there been significant harm that we might be thinking about charging, for example. My primary focus is about building safety for Chloe to go home, whether that's tomorrow, next week, in six months' time. That's my focus. Yep. So I'm going to make sure that every conversation I have is about, is focused on safety and building safety. And what I need to do is be working with them. So what I know is if I start separating mum and dad out, I need to explain really clearly why I'm doing that in a way that's going to make sense and be meaningful for this family and, and in a way that adds to their trust to me, doesn't diminish it. Know, very, very calm and cooperative, which often isn't the case. It'd be interesting to see yeah. how you do yeah. your process. You you wanna, uh, should we ask them to ramp it up a bit? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell you the facial expressions I'm getting from mum. She's not being so calm. She's wait, She's biding her time. I can see that. She's waiting for the moment. Dad's being a little more cooperative, but yeah, we'll get him to ramp it up a bit. And I'm, how are you going in terms of being able to hear properly is, and, and engage from the back? Is that okay? I know it's not ideal. Is that all right? Okay. Cool. Can I ask? Mm. Sorry, I can't write and do it at the same time. I'm going to put it just here for a sec and then I'll give it back over. <coughs> Now, we, can, we could start, we could talk about a whole lot of different things at the moment, yeah? We can start, I can ask you, start asking you questions, you could ask me questions. I'm wondering if it's useful if I explain to you right now what our assessment framework is that we use, that we're going to be working on together. Yeah. Is this an okay time if I do that right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Well, for me, I think um, I'm a guide. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I need to know what we're talking about before we worry about fixing something. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So how about if we talk about what's going on so that so, I know what you think we need to fix? Okay. Now, w the only information I've got at the moment is the hospital's view from the, the social worker. Now that's just one view. Okay. That's not all the views about Chloe. That's not the whole story of of what's going on for Chloe. That's one. Really happy to share that with you. And I know Madeline said she'd talk through some of that with you guys. But that's just Madeline's views. Yeah? Right, but so. Madeline can't keep our kid. You can. So I can. Yeah, absolutely. And how am I going to make a decision, do you think, about whether or not Chloe's safe? How am I going to make that decision? Based on what they say at the hospital. Part, a little bit. Absolutely. Where else? You have to hear from us. Have to hear from you. Who are the other well, important people? Say. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm going to give it my best shot. I'm going to give it my best shot. Mm -hmm. Who are the other important people in Chloe's life who I also need to talk to and find out? Well, you can talk to my sister. She knows me. I'm a good mom. Okay. And she knows I talk to her since I've been pregnant. Um, she's, she's been part there with you as you've been pregnant and yeah. going on. What's, what's her name? And I'm not going to talk to anyone yet, but I just want to start to get a sense of who else you think is important. 
So your sister? Yeah. Carol. Carol, okay. Who else do you want me to talk to? Uh, we go to church, cool. so we can talk to the pastor. Yeah, okay. They're still being pretty helpful, aren't they? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, what's the question here that she asks that's beginning to maybe invite a little bit of dialogue? Were people able to hear it? How am I going to make that decision? Right? And so it's a little bit of what is called a solution focused position question. She's trying to get them to step into her role just a little bit. And it's not meant to be manipulative, it's actually meant to help them begin to come together as a team a little bit. And yes, they're being still a little kind to her, you know. You should stop being so kind. She's really tough, you know, okay? But um, the. Uh, <laughs> It is meant to build uh, a, a little bit of a unified vision so they understand her role. How do you think I'm going to make this decision? Well, you're going to need our input, right? And then you, you begin to get some alignment of goals. Now, we might, we might space jump a little bit to start actually talking about the framework. I'm just mindful of time, yeah. too. Yeah. Um, so hold that wild outburst that was just about to come. <laughs> um, so what I'm, what I'm going to do is what I would normally do now with the family is I would... Now, did you hear me ask the question, is this an okay time for me to explain to you our assessment framework? I'm, I'm genuinely asking that as a question, like, is this, is this an okay time for that? And some parents are like, no, I don't want... No, just... And then they're focused on what they want to focus on now. Other times it's like, yeah, absolutely, I want to know that. So... I'm asking that question. I'm then literally going to draw up the three columns right here with the parents. Yeah, I've got a piece of blank paper in front of me. That's all I've got. I'm going to draw up the three columns with them, write the headings and literally talk them through it. And as I'm doing that, it takes only five minutes. As I'm doing that, I'm explaining the process about their views, other people's views, everyone thinking together. And particularly, the focus is on the third column. So every single time we start to get stuck with each other, I'm going to come back to the third column. What we are here to do is work together to work out what we need to see you guys doing as Chloe's mum and dad for her to be able to go home with you and us all know that she's going to be safe. Every time we get stuck, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah? So I'm just, we're going to space jump now because I want to show you now which part of the framework we might start with. Is that okay for you guys? Just assume that I've given you all of that information, you've mm -hmm. talked that all through. Now, before I came here today, as you know, Madeline sent me through a referral. She told me her views. Thank you. Madeline gave me her views about the stuff that she saw as mum and you as mum and dad doing with Chloe. She said to me, you know, breastfeeding, she said, was going really well. She said that every time Zoe, Chloe was distressed, you guys were picking her up, you were cuddling her, you were holding her. The nurses on the ward, the midwives are saying, they're seeing that your hands-on parenting, your, your caring for, for Chloe is going really well. So Jason, that's what why they... You came? No, that's not the reason I came. No, no. Now, what they also said, Jason, was that the times when you've been on the ward where they, have, haven't, they thought that you weren't affected by alcohol or drugs, they were seeing that your care of Chloe was really nice. They told How me about... How much do they say he's drinking or he's here? Well, what, what yeah. Madeline said is that you were really upfront with her. Yeah, that you said to her that you were drinking at the moment about two or three times a week was less than you had been before, that you've been working on that. Yeah. But still... It's legal. Yep, yeah, absolutely. The hospital was worried about some of those times where you were on the ward and you were drinking and, and looking after Chloe. So they got some worries about that. Well, I haven't been drinking because I've been breastfeeding. They said I was doing a good job. They, absolutely. But some of the worries that the hospital have, we're going to need to work to try and come up with some, a plan so that you guys are going to show everyone that those worries are not going to happen. That's what we need to do together. Now, so when you're talking about when we're arguing or whatever, then uh, that's what you guys are worried about. One of those things, yeah, clothes. yeah. And I'm going to make sure that I'm going to be... Just go ahead. Just go ahead. Use the big one. Okay, no problem. I'm going to make sure that I am talking with you really straight, letting you know every single worry that the hospital has. 
if as we are talking, there's something that I get worried about, I'm going to tell you that. I'm going to write it down. You're going to have a copy of everything. I'm going to tell you that. And I'm going to ask you questions and try and understand, is there anything that you worried about that we also need to make some plans around? Because no worries, what I've learned with families is very rarely are there worries that families can't sort out. Yeah, Very rarely are there problems that people can't sort and have a plan in place to make sure that their kids are safe. That's what we're here to do together. Can I ask you questions? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I want to ask you what we call a scaling question. I told, I told you about the scale we're, we're going to have here. Yeah. And ask you this question, scale is zero to ten. Who do you want me to start? <laughs> <laughs> you got it, you got it. Okay. Ten would be, you feel like right now you are able to be the dad you have always wanted to be for Chloe. Okay? Ten would be, you feel like you can be the dad you've always wanted to be for Chloe. Zero would be, you think it, things are probably at their worst for you right now, and that's not going to be a good look for Chloe. Where would you be on that scale, zero to ten? Ten. You'd be a ten, okay. Now... Imagine that Tina's not in the room and I'm having just this conversation with you, okay? If I was to ask you what Tina, how Tina would scale you, if I, if I asked Tina, okay, scale is zero to 10, where 10 is you think Jason right now is able to be the dad he's always wanted to be 24 seven, where do you think Tina would put you on that scale? She better, yeah. yeah. And I can't is, in your, for you to take some moment, think that through, where would, where would you say Tina would be good for you right now? Uh, I think before we got here, she'd be fine with the tent. But yeah. now that people are saying what we're doing is bad, then maybe you should say uh, six or seven. Okay. okay, okay. Thank you for being straight. Yeah. Tina, for you, I'm going to ask this question about yourself. Same question, yeah? Ten would be, you feel like right now, 24-7, you can be the mum you've always wanted to be for Chloe. Yeah? And zero would be, yeah, you feel like you are at your worst right now in terms of things happening in your life and it's not safe for Chloe to be in your care right now. Where would you be? I just think because she's sick and I think because she's sick and we're here, a nine, um, but I think I'm a good mom and I can be a 10 easy. This is my first baby. Okay. And never easy for anyone. I remember what it was like, first baby. Not easy for anyone, first baby. Now, you've, you've been working with Madeline. You've, you've talked with her a number of times, I know, over the last five days. If I was to ask her that question, if I said to her, OK, 10 would be that Tina and Jason could take Chloe home and that Chloe's always going to be safe in their care. There aren't going to be any problems or worries. Um, and zero would be Madeline's so worried about Chloe being in your care that she's recommending that Chloe be in someone else's care at the moment until the worries get sorted out. Where do you think she would be on that scale? Well, I think she has to be close. To, I think she has to be close to zero for her to call you, right? So, uh, for whatever reason, right? You reckon she'd be so, pretty close to zero? Yeah. I mean, otherwise she wouldn't call anybody. Where do? You What do you think would be the biggest thing that she's worried about right now? How come you asked me what I thought you were? I was actually, was? I'm happy to, but I was just going to ask that question <laughs> of, God, this is bloody hard with a microphone. Good, <laughs> yeah. I was actually wanting to ask Jason first what he thought that, that Madeline's worry was. So you okay if I do that first and then come back and I ask you that same question? I'm okay with that, but you asked him where I would put him, and you didn't ask me where I would put him. Where would you put him? I mean, we don't have any fancy college or anything, but I think he's he's working on himself, and so he's probably an eight. And you know, one of the things that one of the things that was really clear to me when I read the referral through from Madeline is that you guys must have. have 
been willing to talk with her because she knew a whole lot about what had been happening for you. Since you got pregnant with Chloe about the changes that you'd made and Jason over the last 18 months, the changes that you'd been making, she knew a whole lot of that stuff already. Okay? And the thing that she said to me, two things she said to me she was most impressed with that, was, that were important to me because it said to me a lot about how we could work together. The first thing she said to me was that you were both really straight about the fact that your drinking still wasn't where you wanted it to be, your drug taking still wasn't where you wanted it to be, and you were working on it. The other thing she said to me was that when you had learnt you were pregnant, you said to Madeline, at that point you stopped using. That's right. Uh, sorry, there was a third thing actually that she was really impressed by, which was she said that you said in the last couple of months, you've been saying to friends of yours, they can't keep coming around now and using at home. Because Chloe's going to be home, obviously, is what she said you said. I want to ask you guys, what, what helped you make that decision, for example, to... Um, at the point, oh, no, let me ask a better question. That's not a very good question. Let me ask you a better question. At what point did you make that decision to say to friends, you can't be coming around with drugs? Well, my mom wasn't a good mom to me, and she let people come around and look where it got me. And so I'm not going to be that. I'm going to be better for my baby. And, and to make that decision, because not an easy decision, I imagine, to make, to be saying that to friends, mm -hmm. yeah? So, at what point did you make that decision? When you, like, in what point during your pregnancy did you get yourself to that place where you were able to do that? When they told me that I was gonna have a baby, and then I know I need to make my life better to make my baby's life better. So, other people can't do that for her, I can't. Yeah, good on you. And was that a decision you made together? Like, did you, you guys talk that through? Well, um, to a degree, I mean, I think um, for me, it was more seeing her go through the change and realizing you're going to have to be different. But, uh, you know, when you're used to getting mad when you're mad, uh, then it takes time to think about that. So uh, for me, it takes longer because uh, I'm not going through the physical stuff, and so we, well, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, not that much, but uh, yeah, uh, over the mental health and uh, talk to him about it because you know um, really didn't come from a great place just like her and. Of course, that's probably why we found each other. And what do you think? What do you think is important? And and you having those appointments, Jason. What what do you think is important about that for you? What's important for you about having those appointments? Uh, just giving me a place to chat uh, about stuff because uh, I don't have anybody to give you a name to talk to, and so I get somebody to chat with that can give me some different ideas and you know it's still part of what who I am is what I do so uh, it's taken me longer to figure that out yeah right, so uh, I know we're having some technical glitches and I apologize what 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 are you noticing like there was kind of two sections um, and I want to ask you in a minute but there was a, a scaling piece that Sonia was beginning a lot of scaling and then there was this second piece that kind of began around, um, at what point did you make the decision to stop using? And Sonia began some inquiry about that. So there were kind of two big sections. What about those sections is standing out? What are you noticing? What are you curious about? Yeah. It's process. It's not just what month did you stop using. OK. It, it, it helps them think, I have the power to make those decisions. And it gets them in that place where they can make more positive decisions. Okay. So the questions actually have an assumption in them that the parents uh, are, are decision makers and they're making some purposeful decisions and they're trying to seek that out a little bit, right? And um, surfacing that in, the pa in their thinking. At what point did you make that? And it's very different from a straight data gathering question. What, you know, when did you stop using, right? So there is this attention to process. There's attention um, 
to uh, pushing their thinking about this. Yeah. Well, the other thing I noticed is that, that mom is, is doing what we frequently see with, with in these kinds of situations, is that she is trying to attack back. Yeah. And, and what I noticed was that Sonia deflected that very, very nicely yeah. by going into talking about, well, what, what Madeline said to me were these three nice things. And, and so we got past that attempt by mom to sort of say, well, you didn't do that. You know, you did it with him, but you did it with me. Okay. So, uh, you know, there was this moment where uh, Tina starts to say, well, you, you know, you asked him this question, you didn't ask me this question. And what Liz is noticing is that Sonia kind of went back and said, okay, you know, I, I can. She tried to explain it. And then she also just kind of went back and went to a little bit about what's working well. I have heard these things. She tried to diffuse it maybe a little bit. Yeah? Yeah? I'm noticing Sonia bring in the voices of others and help broaden the parents' perspective and thinking about what's going on in their life right now by saying, where do you, on the scaling question, where do you think the reporting party would yeah. put you? Where do you think your mom would, what do you think your mom would think about where you are right now? Yeah. So again, I want you to begin to think about questions as a tool, right? Your questions are an intervention. And Sonia, I think, and I want to check in with you, is in the middle of a string with those scaling questions. She's starting with, where were you? And she gets a very high number from, I think, I think it was dad first. Yeah. And then where, um, where is mom? You know, and she gets a very high number. And then I think, and I, I'm curious, um, you want to say something about your thinking of then asking them to ask about the reporting party? Yeah. What made you want to go there and what were your hopes about that? So I've made the decision that I'm going to start with a scaling, the scaling question in moving into the framework. That's where I was starting. I wasn't starting with either the worries, the what's going well, I was starting in with a scaling question. It's often where I'll start because it really grounds it for families, you know, and, and did you hear the question I asked? It wasn't your standard scaling question. It wasn't about safety. It was actually about... Can you take off the lapel one? Just take that one right off. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'll take it. It was the, the question I actually asked was, 10 is you're able to be the parent you've always wanted to be. Um, and then I shifted that into a more safety scale afterwards. So what I was trying to do is first of all get their thoughts. I'm, I'm actually at that point acknowledging them as a parent and asking them, you know, your goal, which I'm, I'm making that assumption is that parents want to be the best parents they they can be. And even if they don't, to me that's a kind of an implicit acknowledgement of parents is to assume that that's, to let them know that, I, that that's what I think, that I think they want to be the best parents they can be. Now dad says 10 and sometimes we get that. In fact, when I've asked that scaling question, I don't think I've ever got 10 when I've asked about you're able to be the pa parent you've always wanted to be. But if I get 10, yeah, then I'm just going to ask someone else's view. So you're at a 10. I'm not going to argue with dad about that. Yeah, like, bullshit, you're at a 10. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm not going to argue at all with that. In fact, I don't know if you noticed, I gave no char or I tried to give no charge to it. Just 10, moving on. Yeah. What would have been your next question after, so <laughs> what do you think the reporting parties had and they said it was low, it must have been a zero? zero. My next question to him was, do you remember? What do you think is the biggest thing Madeline's worried about that has her that low? That was a question I asked. That was a point that mum interrupted. Hang on a second, you didn't ask me about, and that's okay. Now I then moved away from that question. That was quite deliberate at that point, just to move away from that question, because that's a little bit tricky. My sense was, okay, talking about the worries, we're not quite there yet, that's okay. Let's talk about some of what's going well, and we'll come back to the worries. And what's fantastic about having the framework in front of you is you can see where the gaps are. I can see which bits we've covered and which bits we need to come back to. Yeah. Um, we got a couple of questions and then it's quarter of. So yeah. I want to think if you want to yeah. do a couple more minutes and then we're going to have them do a little yeah. reflection. Yeah. yeah. Sounds so good. just a couple more. Yeah, I saw a couple hands. Yeah, yeah. Mike. Yeah, just a real quick comment. What I, what I was really impressed with was your ability to really critically think 
you know, at what point did I start deciding I'm going to start promoting the safety for my children that didn't exist in my life? That focus is really going on to their critical thinking about the power they have to create safety in their home for their child. So I, I thought that was very powerful. And which question, one more time, Mike, which question was it? It was about the, the question one was, uh, when did you decide not to have uh, people coming into your home yes. that have maybe a negative yeah. or a yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so here's just a quick point about this. In the midst of these stories we hear, which are filled with moments of harm and danger, there are almost always these exceptions. That's where this whole phrase, signs of safety, comes from. That, like, not to be too silly about it, if the child is alive, the parents have taken some action to protect that child. It may not be enough for that child to go home, be home, whatever, but there is a history of protection that lives along the history of harm. And oftentimes what we do is we scoot past these moments of protection. And it's because we have long forms to answer, and it's because we're, we're socialized in particular ways as treaters. But to draw out the exception, it's not just noticing it, but really to get the details of it. How did you decide to take this step? What were you thinking about? Who else was there? Who else, you know, did you two talk about it? Yeah. 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 Um, and, and the whole idea is if she understands, if they understand how they took that step, they're more likely to be able to repeat it, right? And we're certainly more likely to be able to talk about it. Last comment, and then we're going to move ahead. I just wanted a clarification on that when you said, what is the biggest thing about Madeline's, you know, worry, and then you went on. Is that almost like a rhetorical question just to get them to think about that? Is that why No, you well, yeah, it wasn't rhetorical. Um, Madeline has said to me that she talked through her worries with the parents. What I don't know is how much of that stuck with them. And I don't know how much of that they agree with, disagree with. So we're just starting to explore that area. Now, but what I was doing was, I'm trying to create some space for us to talk about the hard stuff. So I'm just at this early point checking in, is it okay for us to talk about the hard stuff yet? And it was pretty clearly from mum, no. But so what I was doing is, dad says to me, he's at a 10, Madeline's pretty close to zero. Um, and I'm asking, well, what do you think is the thing that she's most worried about that has her pretty close to zero? I wanted to try and just see if we can surface some of the worries at this point. But we couldn't, and that's okay. Can I ask just one quick question of everyone? Did you notice when Mum started to give me some details about the decisions they had made, the thinking they'd done about friends not coming to the house, those safety decisions they had made? Um, what did you notice in terms of me complimenting her? What did you notice I did? It'd be a bit hard with the microphones. Yeah. There's an opportunity right there for me to give this mum a compliment. Yep. She's pretty pissed with me. She's not showing it so much yet, but she's pretty pissed. And my, it's just intuitive, I'm thinking, don't give her too big a compliment at this point, Sonia, because she's likely to tell me where to shove it. And, and compliments, I mean, I think they're incredibly powerful when they're real and genuine. But if I had at this point, if I'd said to mum, wow, that's fantastic, that's amazing you were able to do that. You know, I'm so impressed. What am I likely to get back? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. I mean, that's just my instinctive response. So what I did there is I just looked her in the eye and I just said, yeah, go you, you know, good on you, and just moved on. So it was just like a beginning. And I noticed that with compliments that I can't, you kind of feel the, the, the space a little bit. Like, just give a little compliment and is that going to land? Are those parents going to let that in? And if not, just back off a little bit. There's been lots of opportunities for me to compliment so far. And 
you know, we can easily slip into thinking, yeah, we just want to compliment, 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 but actually that can just feel very condescending and patronising. So I'm trying to be real and I'm trying to really feel what's happening with this mum and how can we make the best connection that's happening, yeah. What happened without really going, wow, fantastic. Exactly. What, what was it that, that really focused you on protecting your child and providing safety in the home? Yeah. So that became the real ownership for her. Yeah, yeah thank you. So one last quick thing that I would like to demonstrate, if that's okay, before we move on, is now you've seen me start then with a scaling question. The other place that I very commonly start is the family's goals, which might seem like a really odd place to start. Who's thinking that's a really strange idea, Sonia? <laughs> it's one of the places I very often start with families, quite as quickly as possible I want to get to there, to really try and focus on what we're here to focus on, which is them taking Chloe home because everyone's confident Chloe's going to be safe. And the sooner we can get to talk about that, my experience, the sooner these people buy in to working together. So what I'm going to explore is how quickly can I get there with them. And sometimes what you'll notice happens is parents will start to talk a little bit about what they think they need to be doing and then it goes off into somewhere else and then we can come back later. That's okay, but I'm trying to get there as quickly as possible. Yeah, okay. So, I imagine that um, to think that we could actually, um, sorry, let me start that again. Oh, one more quick. Did you notice me before I asked a question and I said, actually, that's, a, that's not a very good question. Let me ask a better question. I'll do that often with families where I'm literally not thinking of the question I'm going to ask until it starts. Mm -hmm. I don't know if other people get to that, you know, do that too. Yeah. And sometimes I don't even know what question I'm going to ask until I start and then I'll say, I still don't know. And I'll say, okay, let me just ask you a question. I still don't know what the question is. And then I'll go, and then it comes. And I've just learned to trust that. Every now and again, I'll start and the question's not a good one. And I just do that, you know, like, that wasn't a very good question. Let me think of another one. And a better question always comes. That's what I've just learned to trust. So, yeah. You know, in us working together, my best hope is that together we can come up with a really clear description of what you are both going to do in looking after Chloe that's going to satisfy everyone. That we're going to say, okay, that's not perfect. It doesn't have to be perfect. You come to my house, see me parenting with my son, it's, you'd be seeing far from perfect. Yeah? It doesn't have to be perfect, but what we need to see is a very clear description of how you're going to take care of Chloe that's going to show us that she's going to be safe in your care. So you mean we just uh, don't drink, don't fight, and be happy? Okay, get in the mic. So you mean we're just supposed to not fight, don't drink, don't use drugs, and just be happy? You, uh, does that save you enough? You want to write that down? You want to, you want to write that down for me for every family we work with, Jason? Come on down. Okay, tell. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So. Can you just, let's, let's start to get some of this down, hey? Let's start to write some of this stuff down. I don't really care what you want right now. Yeah. I just want to listen to the doctors. I want to know what it takes for my baby to get healthy so she can come home. And then I want to leave here and leave all this here yeah. and take her home. Yeah. And, and to do that, like the doctors are the ones, obviously, that are going to talk to you about medically, what, what Chloe needs. What, what they said to me, I'm imagining that, you know, I hope that they've said this to you, is that she's actually doing really well. They said to us that if she keeps doing as well as she, she's doing right now, within a couple of days, two to three days, she's going to be ready to go home. You know, that's, it sounds like she's doing fantastically. The, the worries that the hospital have about whether or not she's going to be safe in your care, whether you are going to be drinking, using drugs, fighting at home. Those are the worries that the hospital have. That's the stuff we've got to sort out together. Yeah? That 
I mean, I've, you know, I've got quite a bit of time in the next couple of days to have these conversations with you. My supervisor, she's freed me up because our priority is that Chloe gets to go home and she gets to be safe with you. Right now, I don't know. You ask me where I am on that scale. You guys ask me where I am on that scale of zero to 10. I don't know yet. Based on just what I've heard from the hospital, I'm about where Madeline is. I'm about a two or a three. But once I've talked to you and heard more about who you both are as mum, a mum and a dad, who you're going to be as parents for Chloe, what you're going to do to keep her safe, what other people in Chloe's life are going to do to keep her safe, I'm going to be in a different place on that scale. So right now, you know, we have to keep talking, if you're willing, about what you're going to do to make sure she's safe. Now you said to me, you're already at a 10, but what you know is we're not at a 10 yet. Yeah? We need to hear a lot more from you about what's happening in your family. Who are you going to be as parents for your little girl? So some of what you're saying to me might be, you said to me, not drinking. What did you say? Say it to me again. Uh, not drinking, no drugs, um, no fighting, okay. and be happy. Okay. So <laughs> no drinking, no drugs, no fighting. Don't worry. Be happy. <laughs> now, you know, if, if we could create a perfect world for kids, that's what we'd want, huh? And, and you don't have to be perfect parents. I'm not going to certainly be asking that of you. I don't so know how anyone. how many drinks does that mean? If I'm not perfect, does that mean more in a week? Well, yeah, no, you, you tell me. So for you to be able to be the dad you want to be for Chloe, and look after her and keep her safe. When you're looking after her, how many drinks would you, would you feel comfortable with that you could drink and be looking after Chloe? How many drinks? What's your thoughts? Well, I think um, if she was there, then I could go drink or whatever, go with the buddies or whatever, and then it wouldn't matter. But if I'm home alone, then I don't think any. Yeah, that makes great sense. That makes really good sense. So if you're home alone, if you're the one, if you're the parent on the ball at that time, mum gets to have a much deserved rest. If you're that parent, your thoughts are no drinking at that point. Yeah, I think that would be okay. Yeah. So if you're the parent home, you're the one looking after Chloe, mum's having a rest, your, your thoughts are no drinking at that point when you're the one taking care of her. Okay. You said something really interesting. Jason, are you okay, Tina, if I keep asking Jason a bit more? Sonia? We're at 12 o'clock, just so Okay, now. all right, honey, thanks. Yeah. Is this a good place to start? Yeah. I might just ask one more yeah, yeah, yeah. question, then we go. Um, you're saying to me that when you're looking after her, no drinks, but, w but if, if Tina's looking after Chloe or someone else you trust is looking after Chloe, then you could be out drinking with the boys. Okay, hard question now, all right? I want to ask you, tell me about a time when you have gone out drinking with, the, with your buddies and you might have got really drunk. I don't know. What, what, I don't know what really drunk looks like for you. I know what it looks like for my family. I don't know what it looks like for you. So you've gone out. You've got really drunk. Tell me about a time where you've been able to do that and come home and things are still okay between you. Like it hasn't ended up in a fight. Because I know things have got pretty, pretty ugly at times between you both, hey? Mm -hmm. So tell me about a time where you've come home and it hasn't got ugly like that. Where it's, you've actually been able to, you know, things have been okay. If she's asleep. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You tell me. Because you can't do it. Yeah. Okay. It always, it always is a fight. You know, I just, I so admire your guts, you know, and being able to just say that to me straight like that. Yeah. Okay. And you know what? There's lots of families that's the case for. You know, where drinking just means it ends up in a fight. And that's okay. It doesn't mean not drinking, huh? just means make a plan. So that. And don't come home. And don't come home. That's one idea. Nice idea. Has that ever happened, Tina? Has there been a time where that's happened? It just means to not drink because we didn't come home tonight. We should come home tomorrow. <laughs> 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 And this is some of the hard stuff. You I mean like, here you go, not only have you got a new baby, now you've got child protection in your life. But these are really hard conversations, you know, and I just I guess we want to just honour you both really that you're prepared to start having these hard conversations with me in the room as well.
because this is the hard stuff now that you're going to need to work out because what you want is Chloe home and not, you imagine, hey, I mean, just, just for a moment, just think about the worst time where you have been out drinking, you've come home, it has got ugly between you. Now, I want you to imagine what it would have been like if Chloe had been there, home with you both, in your arms, and it got that ugly. Yeah. That's what we want to make sure doesn't happen. And what I need to hear from you guys is your best thoughts about how to do that. Because I can give you a plan. It ain't going to work, most likely, for your family. You know, you're going to know what's going to work. You know what it's like when times get ugly. You know what, so that's what we need to talk through. Okay, we stop there. Okay. So, I'm going to shorten our thing. Yeah. Cool, okay. yeah. So just real quickly, I know we're near lunch. I want you to get just with the person next to you real quick. One thing you saw that you really appreciated that you were like, you know, Next time I'm working with a client, I really want to give that a try. So one thing you saw that you really thought had immediate applicability. One thing you would have done differently if you had been sitting in Sonia's chair. One thing you would have done differently and one thing you'd like to understand better. So just have a quick conversation. What would you appreciate? What would you have done differently? What would you like to understand better? Just talk for like two or three minutes, okay? the point that I had been waiting for.
Okay, um, so I know you're, you're needing lunch. Uh, we're heading for it. Let's just get a couple of these. A uh, couple of things you saw that stood out, that you felt good about, that you would, you know, you feel like you could bring back to your work, that you'd want to bring back to your work. What were just a couple of things? Yeah. The goal statement. The goal statement. Yeah, okay, so moving into a conversation about their goals. And, and we'll be talking about this this afternoon. A quick headline, I think, is that um, he clearly was in a very superficial place to start. You know, don't worry, be happy. It's still a good place to begin. And that's where the rigor can start to come in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, our little group, um, one of the Eldorado for me, Deidre said that uh, the scaling was very interesting and asking the scaling so early on. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see how that works. Okay. So one thing you might want to try is yeah. to try the scaling earlier on. Yeah. yeah. I, I, so I liked how it, they were saying, oh, well, we're just perfect, we're tens. Then you started trying to, well, the, you know, I'm here, so there has to be a reason. So then you'd ask them, lots of other people, why, yeah. why do exactly. you think that? Yeah. So. Yeah. And we often start family conferences with a scaling mm -hmm. question. Yeah. And so you're asking someone, where are you on the scale? Wherever they are, whether they're a one or a five or a nine, what's going on that has you that high? That's your first question. What's happening that has you that high? High as a nine. What you're eliciting there is the what's going well. Then, okay, but you're not at a ten yet. You know, so what is it that has you that low? What are you worried about that has you, you know, at a nine or a seven or a three? And then what needs to happen for you to get a bit higher? So you're actually eliciting all three columns with your scaling question. For me, I think it needs to be a focusing on the improvement part. I mean, teaching a child to focus because oftentimes I have to use that to kind of bring the tone down to him as opposed to, you know, this is why we're here, this is what we want to do. See, it's not the teacher's power to do. So getting that, making that agreement in the beginning. Yeah, well said. Yeah. Um, if there was so much, I was trying to get more to stop there all in. But one of the things you said near the end that I just went, oh, that's just, just one tiny little word, and it just switched everything, was when you said, let's come up, have you, can you come up with clear descriptions mm -hmm. rather than a clear plan? Whoa. Yeah. I mean, a description of something is, is so much more. Uh, I've never done that before. <laughs> <laughs> And I did, I thought, I really like that. I'm going to say it again. <laughs> I know, yeah. It was not so. I don't know where that came from. Must have been channeled from California. <laughs> something you would have done differently if this had been used, just a, a tweak, something about your own practice that's important to you that you wouldn't want to lose track of. So our excitement about signs of safety, you want to say, hey, you know, don't lose track of this thing that's really important in my practice. What's one thing you would have done differently? Yeah. Thinking, well, don't say who the RP is. Yeah, <laughs> right? Who the reporting party is? Yeah. yeah. So in, in, I don't know how it is in well, Australia. Well, if it's, if it's in, um, in a hospital context in Australia like that, the hospital social worker is absolutely have gone and said to the family, I'm needing to now refer to child protection. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, always. Yeah. yeah. Always. Yeah. Including times one family I worked with where the dad was then literally, he had, a, he had bipolar, he was literally rampaging through the hospital. He was going to kill that social worker. But yeah, we know we do work with that all the time. Yeah. I was very thoughtful about the same thing though in Massachusetts. You would not be able to say who the okay. mandated reporter was. Okay. But you could certainly use the same questions. You know, what do you think the person who called me is worried about? Yeah. Now, the yeah. temptation is that then it gets into that whole, well, who was it? And can't you tell me? And you're going to have yeah. to walk well, that we, whole thing. Yeah. And we have both too because we have a whole lot of reporters who we can't disclose. Family members, neighbors, community members. Yeah. yeah. And we deal with the same. One other thing that you'd want to do differently in your practice? Yeah. Well, I just think she kept referring to these are the hospital's concerns, but never took any accountability as I, I am CPS and these are why I'm concerned and this is why I'm here. So they kept yeah. going, well, if you don't have any concerns, why are you here? <laughs> why? Yeah. So I think at some point, instead of falling back on the hospital, well, this is your history and this is, yeah. I think she was tiptoeing around some of the stuff too much. Yeah. 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 Do, you wanna, do you have a thought? Um, only that in that early time, I guess what I'm trying to do is say, I'm trying to say, I don't know everything yet. 
you know. I just know a little bit so far. And I, get, I use that a lot to try and say to the parents, I need to hear from you. Yeah, but I hear what you're saying, you know, because both the, the um, people who played Tina and Jason were saying to me, we just wanted to know what the worries were. Um, and, but I use that a lot where I'm trying to say, right now, based on what I know, this is where I am, but this is very early days, I need to hear from you. So that, that's my kind of thinking there, yeah. You saying like this is where I am at the end. You gave your position on the scale, scale yeah. which to me did not reflect any of the conversation that you had just had with them, because you hadn't, like she said, taken any ownership of the concerns that Child Protective Services had. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of positive feedback, which is good in rapport building. But then as a parent, I want to know where you come up with the two or three, because you haven't brought up any negative issues with me. <laughs> You didn't yeah. talk about the DV ongoing, you didn't talk about yeah. all yeah. these things, yeah. so that didn't seem genuine in terms so of... So what you'll have noticed is I didn't even talk about the worries yet. We didn't even get to the first column, really. And that's a very deliberate decision on my part, because what, what do you notice happens? If you start talking about the worries up front, what do you notice happens? Yeah, so that's what I'm doing. but, but. We are absolutely going to talk about them, and, and, the pa and I was saying that to the parents. But you know, there's times you work with families, and that's absolutely where you need to start. Yeah? So I'm wondering if it would have been better maybe not to even scale based on just looking at, you know, the, some of the better things yeah. in, until we got into that arena, yeah. not to even put a scaling on it. Yeah. Do you know what I liked? What you did right before is first you said, I don't even know what number I'm at yet. Yeah. You know, and I actually thought that would be a really nice thing to say to people, you know, and that, you know, and, continue, and that's why I need to ask you some more questions, and maybe that's why can I now start asking you some more about the worries, you know, yeah. and, yeah. Um, but I, I really liked that too. Yeah, yeah. 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 But yeah. she did say that based on what she got from the social Yes, then she, that's, that's where she, she said she that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. She's still listening to the parents. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and what, you, what you're seeing is what happens with families. Hey, we're just kind of winging it a bit. <laughs> you know, you're going wherever you can go. Yeah. And you're, you're drawing on all of your wisdom and experience and your instincts about what works yeah. and what might work. And sometimes what happens is I walk away and I thought, well, that was a waste of space, Sonia. You really blew that. Yeah. Go back, think what other questions might have been useful. And I'll come back to families and say, sorry, I don't feel like that was very useful last time, you know. Can, I, can we try again? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just one um, note that I really, really liked was the beginning um, component of um, safety network. And just kind of um, after the scaling questions, getting into well, who else can tell me more about your, your parenting. And that to me is a perfect segue. And I'm trying to figure out how to start that up in the beginning and how to explain that. And I yes. think that's a perfect place for that. And the parents led into that. That's why I went early. Yeah. They led into that. Yeah. For those of you who are new to this practice, you'll see a lot in the coming days. Uh, we're going to push you to refocus the lens past the nuclear family. You know, and, and you'll hear me do a riff on nuclear families. But yeah. um, that really, that uh, we can't get safety just from the people we're worried about. And so right from the beginning, how do we get more people involved? Yeah. 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 So Last, thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Say so thank yous to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So thank you so much to the two people who were mum and dad for us. Yeah, thank yeah. you, guys. Thank you. And, and thanks, too, for hanging in past that technology. I know that must have been a bit frustrating yeah, to try and to. hear that. Yeah. Um, my clock says 12.20. We will start at 1.20. Um.